Um, buenos and half a day. Uh, before we begin this public hearing, I'd like to pay our respects to the late speaker, Joe T. San Augustine, who passed away this morning. Uh, the late speaker, the honorable speaker, San Augustine, was a tireless leader of our community and a true public servant. He served our island in many different capacities and he will be greatly missed. We offer our prayers and condolences to his family. And at this time, I ask that we take a moment of silence in his honor. So do us Masi, everyone. Um, at this time, I'd like to call this public hearing to order. The Committee on the Environment, Revenue and Taxation, Labor Procurement, Statistics, Research and Planning is calling this virtual public hearing to order. At the time, it is 9.06 a.m., April 15, 2021. The notice of this morning's virtual hearing was provided via email to senators, stakeholders, and the local media on April 8, 2021 for the five-day notice and April 13th for the 48-hour notice, thus meeting the requirements of open government law. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that have joined me here today. I'll just go by what I see on the screen. Um, Senator uh, Tony Adda. Good morning. Uh, Senator Kito Talahi, good morning. Uh, Senator Talina Nelson. Morning. Uh, Senator, good morning. Senator James Moylan. Uh, Senate, Senator Amanda Shelton. Half a day. Good morning. Half a day. Uh, Senator Mary Torres. Good morning. Uh, Senator Tello Taitigui. Uh, and Senator Joanne Brown. So do us Masi for your support. The purpose of this virtual hearing is to receive testimony on the following items. Uh, executive appointment of Mr. Richard T. Gutierrez to serve as a member the General Public Representative of the Guam Real Estate Commission, uh, Bill Number 90-36 COR, sponsored by Senator James Moylan. It's an act to amend Section 5248 of Chapter 5, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated, relative to requiring monthly reports and justification summaries when purchases are made through a sole source or emergency procurement process. The next item is Bill Number 65-36 COR, sponsored by Senator Amanda L. Shelton, co-sponsored by Senators Mary Camacho Torres, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munia Barnes, Senator Jose Pito Trelahi, and Senator Sabina Flores Perez, myself. It's an act to amend subsections A4, C1, D2, and D4, all of section 7120.1, chapter nine, chapter seven, title 16, Guam code annotated, relative to removing the date of expiration on removal, removable windshield placards and extending the period of time for physician certification on temporary removable windshield placards. The next item is bill number 71-36 COR, sponsored by Senator Amanda L. Shelton, co-sponsored by Senators Talina Cruz Nelson, Vice Speaker, Ro Vice Speaker Tina Rose Moon and Barnes, uh, Senator Mary Camacho Torres and Senator Joanne Brown. It's an act to add a new section 513 and 512 to Part A of Article 1, Chapter 5, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated, relative to adopting a procurement policy in favor of women-owned business and to cite this act as a support for Women-Owned Business Act. The last item on the agenda of this morning, that is, is Bill Number 69-36 COR. It was um, introduced by the Committee on Air, Transportation, Parks, Tourism, Higher Education, and the Advancement of Women, Youth, and senior citizens by the request of the Congressman Manhoban Guahan or the Guam Youth Congress in accordance with 2 GCA section 7102. It's an act to add a new chapter 54C to division two of title 10 Guam code annotated relative to prohibiting the sale of polystyrene foam containers and serving of prepared food using polystyrene foam containers. 
Um, just to, as a reminder, the committee will continue to receive testimony until April 20th, 4 p.m. on Tuesday. And please address to myself, Senator Sabina Flores Paris, Chairperson on the Committee on Environment, Revenue, Taxation, Labor, Procurement, Statistics, Research, and Planning, or it can be dropped off the mailboxes of the Guam Congress Building or emailed to the office at senatorparis.org. So the rules of conduct for this virtual hearing is the host will mute all participants until called upon by the chair and virtual backgrounds should not be utilized during the hearing and participants face must be visible at all times. And when called to speak, please remember to unmute yourself and that you're speaking into the microphone. Uh, members of the committee are wishing to speak may indicate their desire to do so to the chair through the in-app in -app chat feature. The order of questioning will begin with the chairperson uh, followed by senators each senator will be allowed to pose questions to any, uh, uh, any, anybody on the panel. And individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking, and they shall state their name for record keeping purposes. Uh, questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to the character or the motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this rule will result in the removal of, from the host. Um, so now to begin our agenda, uh, first item in the agenda is the executive appointment of Mr. Richard T. Gutierrez to serve as a member of the general public representative of the Guam Real Estate Commission. So just a little background for the listening audience, um, the Guam Real Estate Commission functions. So what, what are they involved with? The commission may adopt rules and regulations relating to the administration. So may adopt rules and regulations relating to the administration of real estate as long as it adheres to law. Uh, the commission adopts a seal which is used in, in all official communications uh, by the commission. The seal is used to certify copies of all records in the office of the commission. The seal along with the signature of the chairman shall be received in evidence in all cases equally and with like effect as the originals. The commission is responsible for hearing client compl complaints towards licensed realtors and brokers and determining the judgments and terms of the complaints filed. The commission may make such recommendation and suggestions of policy to the commissioner as the commission deems beneficial and proper for the welfare and progress of real estate licensees and of the public and the real estate business on Guam. So now to begin um, the testimony. So we would like to invite um, those that have come to testify uh, on behalf of the nominee, and then we'll, it will be followed by the nominee's testimony himself. So I believe at this time, I would like to recognize Gina Campos um, for her testimony. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Senator Perez, and thank you for the time of all the people who are on here and all the senators who have logged on to participate. Um, you know, I, I just wanna thank all of you for your participation. It takes everybody's effort to move things forward. Uh, I'm here to testify in behalf of Richard Gutierrez. I have known him for a long time. Uh, I'm an associate broker with Remax Diamond Realty and I feel his nomination to the commission is critical. He has an opportunity to work with so many of us. He knows how the business, he knows how the real estate industry works, in particular how brokers operate and the things we uh, we have to deal with in our real estate business on a day to day basis. And I think his opinion and his viewpoints and his background are fundamental to his recommendations on the board. And I'd like to see him reappointed. To and do that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Campos. Um, is there anyone else here to testify on his behalf? Uh, please uh, let us know. Okay, so uh, we did have somebody um, register, um, not, not, not present at this time, but perhaps uh, she might be coming in late, a little later. So I would like to recognize um, the nominee himself, Mr. Richard Gutierrez for his testimony. Good morning, Senators. Good morning. Good morning, friends and family. Uh, I'm Richard T. Gutierrez. Uh, 
I'd like to thank you all for this time being here this morning for the opportunity to serve the people of Guam. I'm a certified residential appraiser and the principal appraiser of chief appraisals. I've been in this industry for more than 25 years. And with the help of my team, we have completed more than 14,000 appraisals on island. Currently, I'm being appointed to the general public representative member of the Guam Real Estate Commission. If approved, it will be my second consecutive term of service. During my first term, along with other members of the commission, in order to ensure a level of professionalism for real estate agents, we raised the bar in qualifying and continuing education, as well as updated the examination for licensing. The commission is currently in the process of raising the bar of professionalism for real estate brokers establishing licensing requirements for crematorial brokerage and salespersons. And is working alongside legislation towards obtaining approval on a seller disclosure law through Bill 383-35. I would like the opportunity to continue my service to the real estate industry and our community. In hopes of continuity, I humbly request your approval of my appointment. Thank you again for your time, effort, and continued support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, so I guess we're going to start with the, the questioning, uh, starting from myself and with my colleagues. Um, so yeah, thank you. First, of all, I want to thank you for accepting the, the reappointment uh, nomination. Um, I know you have a, a, a long background of, as an appraiser and um, so I think that um, that brings a new perspective onto the commission itself. Um, so I guess a couple of questions are, um, you know, so what do you foresee? I know you, you kind of discussed that in your, your statement, but, um, and that it looks like the commission is hard at work in updating many, uh, many areas that need uh, addressing. Uh, so as, as a, an appraiser, um, you know, what, what, what have you contributed uh, to the commission and what do you, what do you see as your role in um, assisting uh, in the commission in the future? Well, being an appraiser all these years, uh, I am the president of the Professional Association of uh, Real Estate Appraisers on Guam. And we've always strived in our organization to improve and also increase uh, education on island. Before the online uh, education uh, became readily available via the internet. Uh, we always had to make sure there was at least one appraiser, which back in the day was Mark Gruber, if everyone remembers him. Uh, he would go out and take the courses, get certified, and then come back here uh, on his expense or the organization's expense to better our profession. And being in this industry, working with uh, brokers, agents, title companies, uh, the whole slew of, of people involved with any kind of real estate transaction over the years. Uh, the one thing I always heard through pe from people and always recognize is that without the commission uh, over these years that raising the bar for real estate agents, brokers, everything. It came from the brokers themselves having weekly meetings internally. The top brokerages on island, they actually uh, have weekly meetings with their, uh, with their agents inside just, and they have internal training. Uh, we feel that in order for Guam to catch up to the rest of the states, uh, we have to update uh, the minimum requirements in terms of uh, for brokers, one, and then trickle down to the agents themselves. And with that, it's setting the bar higher will encourage outside investments and also local investments. Uh, they'll have more, uh, you call confidence in Guam. Okay, great. That, that's great to hear. Um, in regards to um, Conflict of interest. Um, um, do you have any conflict of interest? Uh, 
Not that I know of. Okay. No right. conflict. And as far as your attendance on the commission, uh, what would you say your attendance has been? 100%. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the your responses. And I do, again, I appreciate um, you accepting the, the nomination. Um, so I'd like to uh, now uh, open the floor to my colleagues. Um, Senator Talina Nelson, if you have any questions for the nominee. Thank you, um, Madam Chair and Mr. Gutierrez, good morning. Thank you morning. for accepting this appointment. Um, I just, I do have a question. You know, we see that there's um, a struggle for our local families to um, rent um, homes or even to be able to purchase homes because of the increasing rate of the cost of real estate on Guam. Um, do you propose any solutions or recommendations to perhaps um, mitigate the situation or an area um, that you and your role can, can play to allow local families, um, you know, that are making like maybe 35,000 to 60,000 a year, $60,000 a year, being able to purchase their own homes um, and make real estate more affordable? Um, uh, wide, broad question, but uh, Senator Nelson, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> start, um, I guess Carlos Camacho uh, comes to mind, uh, the low cost housing, everything that he's uh, provided over the years where he uses uh, the federal grants, everything is, you know, it's maybe if we could help support possibly more infrastructure to rural areas uh, with the help of GWA and GPA. I know many families out there that have inherited land, but they don't have access to even just a road. And to bring in a power pole today, I think it's the average cost is $6,000 per pole when it used to be maybe about 2,500 to 3,000 depending on the type of ground there was. And, you know, I know a lot of, because I do a lot of work for Guam Housing Corp, uh, you know, but the, it's really the infrastructure. There's a lot of families out there with property and with uh, the different types of financing today, with the low interest rates that the banks are offering, uh, the VA uh, as well, 100% financing, uh, Guam Housing Court as well with 100% financing and also the $10,000 grant for closing costs, which have skyrocketed as well since the mortgage uh, failure back in uh, 2008. Uh, so I feel that it's really the bringing infrastructure to these families or these properties, especially uh, Chamorro Land Trust as well, lease because uh, I'm the only appraiser for VA that can do the leasehold appraisals for VA uh, for proposed construction. I, maybe over the years, I've probably done about only 10 on Guam for VA over the last 25 years. It, it's another avenue that could be taken care of, but the biggest complaint that I hear is really infrastructure for these people. Yeah, and because if you have the land, that's probably about, half or maybe 50% of the, about 50% of the struggle is getting the infrastructure. Yes, thank you for that. And then, um, you know, if you look at other areas, other states, uh, other territories, some of them have real robust real estate laws. And so, you know, we kind of utilize, we kind of, we utilize uh, the Guam Association of Realtors as an um, utilizing its national body as well to guide um, a lot of the operations. And I know that we don't have a lot of real estate laws that regulate um, how realtors um, do business. Do you recommend that we should start taking a look at some of these statutes and perhaps start implementing some statutes to create some an equity or um, 
uh, a level of ethics um, in the way business is done here on Guam as in regards to real estate? Yes, I believe uh, GAR itself, uh, we, we work with them on everything that we do. Uh, we always involve uh, GAR. And I used to be on the board for GAR as well uh, about eight years ago. And so I know the internal workings of GAR and they're always trying to increase their ability to provide education as well. However, the one thing I, I did see, because I was on the, uh, I was on the committee with uh, Fred Harecki, uh for litigation uh, for members bringing in, bring forward uh, complaints of other uh, real estate agents. But the one thing I did notice with the commission, we have a little more bite and teeth uh, to hand down, whether it be fines or denying uh, a broker their license. Or uh, So that's why I feel that this commission uh, is very important. You want, but in terms of working with more stringent statutes, uh, sometimes adding more stringent statutes to the agents, you also have to marry it together with being able to protect them also against the public that they are dealing with because, you know, you can always come across that one person that's just going to take them to court and whether they have a legitimate uh, rhyme or reason to take them to court we also have to make sure that they're equally protected as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gutierrez. I look forward to uh, your confirmation and uh, I support you. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Nelson. Um, Senator Pito Terlahi, uh, if you have any questions for the nominee. Richard, thank you for uh, for being with us this morning. And I know that going through your, uh, your record of service in the, uh, you know, uh, with the commission, I know that you're you're an essential uh, uh, member of the commission. And there's only one thing that that I wanted to ask Richard, and this is, <clears throat> you know, when I was growing up, um, I've always been told that uh, the prices of land uh, depends on the economical return uh, 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 back then, uh, but. I don't know if it's still like that today. And what are some of the requirements that will increase the price of land? Is it structures or location or what? That's that's the only thing that I wanted to know right now. Uh, it goes back to uh, the infrastructure. Uh, there's there's so many properties out there that uh, there's one family that there's 14 people that qualify for a loan. And they want to build on their family property. Right now, and it's just getting out of probate uh, soon. But when it comes out of probate, it's going to cost them. I think it was like they got quotes of three hundred thousand dollars just to bring in water and power, and just to open up the road. And that's just with uh, a coral. And that was their that was one of their cheaper quotes uh, because to bring in a six inch line can cost you up to one hundred forty, one hundred sixty dollars a linear foot. Or a six-inch water line in the, when a private person approaches uh, a contractor. I believe my father just laid in about 1,200 linear feet of, of uh, a water line for a big subdivision up there in, in Gigo. And it just, these families, they just, so by opening up, I was getting off tangent, sorry about that, Senator, but uh, in order to increase land value, uh, especially those lands that are just raw land, uh, bringing in infrastructure uh, to certain areas that are developable, meaning they have a uh, nice topography, they're not gonna have to spend uh, millions of dollars uh, like they have been doing up there in Buena Vista uh, in Santa Rita. I think that's uh, uh, Henry Simpson's project. Uh, those, those properties were not uh, developable and he spent uh, millions and millions of dollars to bring it in himself. And he's been very successful at selling those properties to locals, 
and as well as uh, people coming into Guam for for work for the military buildup as well. So it's really about infrastructure. But I just have to stress infrastructure because you know, and to me, I don't know what the costs uh, for GWA and GPA if they were to front up uh, the cost of bringing that in, maybe charge an extra three, four hundred dollars a month for those uh, individuals. I think they used to do that in the past when they would bring in uh, sewer lines like they did in Legend before they would connect people uh, at the expense of GWA and then charge them $5,000 over, over a certain period of time. I don't know if they still do that as well. So, there's different Richard, ways you know, to increase. Uh, another thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is that, you know, what about uh, anticipated improvement on property such as big buildings, shopping centers and all that, would that change the, uh, a, the value of the property? Uh, I'm talking about anticipated you know, plans to, to, uh, to build those stuff. Uh, it, it would. Uh, a good example is Micronesia Mall when they, when they constructed there and built the, the property values around there from my understanding uh, as before my time of appraising, uh, but talking to some of the commercial appraisers, it, it did help uh, the surrounding uh, neighborhoods and and uh, commercial uh, properties around there in terms of anticipated costs. But the biggest issue that people have, uh, big developers or anyone that wants to improve a property, is uh, a lot of the, the red tape to get through the approval process. Uh, just to get an approval on, let's say, a condominium or let's say do a, a, a zone use change. Um, it took me, I have a property that's renting uh, in Mighty and I, my father's a consultant and I thought he would charge me a lot less money, but he didn't. He charged me the same as he charges everyone else, but it, it took almost two years to change an R2 property fronting Route 8 with sewer front and on the off street. It took almost two years to convert it to commercial when everywhere else around it is commercial. And that's because he could, uh, we couldn't get uh, a quorum with uh, TLEC and GLEC. So Richard, when we go into uh, zone changes like R1, R2, M1 zone, uh, so the the prices would then increase, right? If there's an anticipation to go into the different rezoning, uh, you know, requirement. Yes, and by going to the rezoning requirement, so if you're going from agriculture to R1, uh, preferably there's they usually do that when they, the GWA brings in the sewer line because. What that allows is it allows for, especially when you're over the Northern Aquifer to subdivide to smaller lots. So an R1 zone lot with sewer can go down to 5,000 square meter, uh, square feet, which is I think about 476 square meters, uh, plus or minus. Uh, so there's, and I think that's why they created the GOEC back in the days because uh, they would have those spot zone changes through, unfortunately the, legislature and when and it's out in the middle of the jungle with no infrastructure so having an r2 zoned or a uh, in the middle of uh, the jungle there in telefofo with no infrastructure no road uh, were they anticipating the future uh, they'll never be able to use it because without sewer you cannot use the r2 zone so Hand in hand with the zoning uh, infrastructure, especially uh, sewer, public sewer, has to come into play. And with the limited amount of land here in Guam, uh, the more sewer lines we can provide that uh, are usable, because there are some sewer lines out there, from my understanding, that are not usable, uh, whether it's because they couldn't get a pump station or they couldn't uh, get agreement with the landowner to purchase a small portion to do a pump station, uh, it really comes down to, you have to make sure the infrastructure is there. And that's why I believe they created the GOC uh, for that because uh, spot zoning through the legislature, uh, 
back then was the only means, but at the same time, they were also, uh, we have a property that's zoned PUD. I have no idea why, because it has no, no sewer. So we can't use the PUD. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And I, I just want to let you know that I stand in support of your nomination. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Peter Chalahi. Uh, Senator uh, Amanda Shelton, if you have any questions for the nominee at this time. Okay, maybe we'll come back to you. Um, Senator uh, Tony Ada, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Richard. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation and uh, stepping up to the plate again to be renominated. I was just looking at your, your packet and on page page two of the prior government of Guam service, it was left blank. And I thought this was just a, a initial appointment. So perhaps maybe Madam Chair, just to indicate that he has prior service with government of Guam, uh, that he was on the board previously. But I have no questions of uh, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, I think he's a excellent choice again to renominate to the board. And he has my full support and my vote. And Madam Chair, I ask that you move his confirmation forward onto our next session agenda. Uh, congratulations, Richard, and uh, thank you again for your service. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Senator Ada. Um, Senator Jim Moylan, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Congratulations, Richard. Uh, you're obviously uh, well fitted for the job, and I'm glad you came back for a second time. So I think you'll be very helpful uh, in doing the job there and protecting uh, the people and the real estate values of, of the island. Uh, you, you gave some uh, good statements to some of the earlier questions and uh, especially that last one regarding uh, quorums and how that really put things back uh, a couple of years, getting those things uh, completed. We're, we're delaying pro progress, right? So I'm hoping uh, once your nomination gets to the floor and I, which I will support uh, that you would be able to reach out to us uh, your senators here and, and bring that to our attention so we can uh, address those things. I think it's important uh, it, when you identify those problems so we can find some workable solution if legislation is needed. At, at the same time, I'm hoping you'll be able to reach out to us when you see legislation uh, being proposed and how it can positively affect uh, your, the price of homes and, and real estate or how it, how it would not affect it uh, correctly. So with your appointment, uh, please uh, consider to reach out to us, your senators. And uh, likewise, I'm going to get your cell number because I'm going to be reaching out to you too. So thank you and congratulations again for your nominations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Uh, Senator Mary Torres. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Gutierrez, I appreciate your discussion about real estate values on Guam and the infrastructure need, because I think that that's a, a topic that, that really needs to be pushed forward if there's gonna be any equity um, with people that the haves and the have nots or the land rich and the cash poor. So I appreciate that. And I think one thing that, that we, would, we would really like to also help reconcile as we go forward in the, in the uh, recovery effort post COVID or during the phasing, uh, the easing up of, of COVID restrictions is uh, how do we make whole or help now the realtors who have been adversely affected by the moratoriums on evictions? Um, I think that, you know, there has been some relief offered through GIDA um, to renters that, you know, has passed through to the, the the landlords, um, particularly, you know, business landlords, but um, the the majority of people who are, you know, the the average everyday workers or small investors um, have not had that kind of relief uh, because of the moratorium on eviction. So, I'd, I'd be very interested to um, to work with the association and also to try and get some practical. Um, recommendations to what could be a solution, um, it, you know, and, and I just want to make that general comment um, in addition to your support, but uh, if you have any, any you know, uh, comments on that idea, I, I would appreciate it as well. Thank you, Senator. 
tough question. Uh, what do you do if you can't? Wow. So unfortunately, uh, I have one or two tenants and I was able to, uh, you know, allow them to stay there uh, rent free. I was able to afford it. I just gave them simple jobs inside and out uh, around the house and, you know, just so they could feel like they're not just uh, staying there. But in terms of helping out la uh, small landlords and, and I mean, that's something I would have to really sit down and discuss uh, with you and maybe other professionals in the industry, uh, because majority of my my tenants are either business owners that were able to stay open because I have a couple of commercial buildings that were, and on the tenant side, it's mostly friends and that were staying at my tenant. So uh, never had to think about that, Senator, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure I can gather some, some brokers and some real estate agents and possibly other uh, uh, owners that have multiple uh, uh, complexes. Uh, so that way we can uh, sit down together and get uh, uh, come up with a, a good game plan moving forward. Thank you. And I, I think it's always important whenever you're looking at real estate, you know, to look at the whole spectrum because people are affected in different ways. And while we try to protect one, we uh, we inadvertently uh, harm others. So that, that would be the, the leveling off that I, I think we we need to discuss going forward as we recover from this uh, economic depression and this, you know, this COVID um, restrictions that we've had. But thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't want to uh, take up too much time. And congratulations also on your appointment. And you you do have our support. Thank you, Senator Torres. All right. Thank you, Senator Torres. Uh, Legislative Secretary Shelton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I apologize for earlier, I had to step away, but I appreciate the discussion this morning, uh, Mr. Gutierrez, and your answers to all of the questions, especially regarding affordable uh, housing and development for our, our community. I appreciate uh, the work that you're doing, uh, and I congratulate you on your reappointment. Uh, and you do have my support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Shelton. Senator Taitukui? Tijus Masi, Madam uh, Chair, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, Richard. Um, thank you so much for uh, wanting to continue to serve on this uh, commission. Great. Uh, you've done, that's what happens tonight when you do a good job, they, they keep you on. So <laughs> this is your second term. So greatly appreciate it. I think people saw your wealth and, and realized that you, you're a great asset to this commission. I do have some questions with regards to, of course, you talked about quorum and not being able to meet it. And um, um, part of the commission's responsibility is to, I think, is it to approve um, individuals who wanna be a real estate uh, license, have their real estate license, uh, the process that, uh, so does your commission actually do those uh, approvals? No, it's uh, insurance and banking uh, under Alice Cruz. Uh, they they approve anything they bring they bring forward to us. If there's any issues uh, or complaints about a licensee or a soon to be licensee who's applying, uh, there are some uh, like if someone is leaving an office and they're applying to be a broker uh, after being in an office for two years, uh, if they're the past broker has any issues, uh, that's when Alice's department will bring it to us to further discuss. And then moving forward, we'll either send it to the AGs if it needs, especially if it's dealing with any kind of fraud or any kind of federal, uh, you know, uh, cashing checks that were supposed to be made out to the company. Uh, mm -hmm. Those issues have come up uh, over the past and that's when they bring it to us. So we don't, uh, we just basically gave the recommendations for the increase of uh, establishing increased number of years to become a broker, increased number of pre-licensing education hours. Uh, those are the, what we were uh, mainly discuss is uh, amending the law to, to up the professionalism of being a real to How is the commission funded? 
are we funded? Yes. Uh, from my understanding, uh, through revenue tax. Okay. I yeah. see. The only funding we've ever needed uh, to date has been uh, just to advertise our meetings. I see. Yes. Okay. And then uh, also when we do find, and we have find a, a few agents and brokers, uh, the fund goes to, to, from my understanding, it goes to our commission fund. I see. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, you definitely have my support. I look forward to voting yes on your nomination. And again, thank you for your service to the island. I greatly appreciate it, Richard. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Kaidegui. Senator Brown. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and certainly uh, thank you to Mr. Gutierrez for his continued uh, service in the capacity of uh, being a member of the Guam Real Estate Commission. Uh, he had mentioned in his testimony, and I know that we were aware of this with regards to um, the lack of meetings with the Guam Land Use Commission, and I just wanted to inquire um, of what action or what action does he think needs to be taken uh, because obviously, I mean, we all recognize having gone through this pandemic, the challenges our community has faced uh, individually and collectively. Uh, but certainly it's brought a standstill to a significant part of our economy. And I just wanted to get his thoughts on that, on perhaps why um, there was not more attention placed uh, with regards to the Land Use Commission operating. I mean, we're able to... In communicate today on Zoom. Uh, other commissions and uh, boards have been able to do so as well. Uh, and what are his thoughts on that or what actions does he see uh, for the Guam Real Estate Commission to move forward publicly uh, so that we can get more responsiveness from the Guam Land Use Commission so that the government doesn't become a, a, you know, an obstruction or a challenge to helping facilitate economic activity, which we know and while we certainly are living in the comfort of, uh, you know, the, the money coming in from the federal government, we know that has a timeline and a limit. Uh, and my concern certainly is our ability to bridge over from where we are now to where we're going to be uh, when, when this funding stops and, and trying to get our economy uh, stimulated again and get our people, uh, particularly those in the private sector, working. So I wanted to get his insight with regards to that issue from his perspective. So just put in perspective, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, it was about six years ago uh, with the uh, Guam Land Use Commission when they had a, a problem getting uh, a quorum. Uh, today, they're, they're doing an excellent job. Uh, they're meeting uh, every month, uh, I believe, or sometimes uh, two or three times a month. So today they're doing a, an excellent job at, at getting together, maybe because it's easier to get together as Zoom, because majority of the people that are on the, these type of uh, commissions, uh, they are either very business, uh, busy business owners. Uh, so actually physically going to, to meet at a meeting, actually it's, it's this pandemic has opened up uh, uh, Zoom, which is, or any kind of online meeting place and it allows people to meet whether they're on vacation, whether they're on a business uh, trip or, uh, let's say they're having a baby in the hospital, they can actually get on the Zoom meeting <laughs> and still do it. Uh, you know, so, and I, I don't know the inner workings of the Guam, Guam Land Use Commission in terms of are they being uh, compensated uh, with pay or not, uh, you know, especially if they're meeting more than once a month, but uh, maybe uh, also more support with uh, Guam, uh, DLM as well, from what I heard, they're understaffed uh, and they need more people in that department because when you do apply, uh, they need to notify along with the consultant. If the person is using a consultant, they need to notify within 500 feet uh, of the property, uh, all the landowners uh, via mail uh, notification and also on-site notification. Uh, so from my understanding that that could also be a, a holdup too, is uh, not enough uh, employees for to help support uh, the GLUC as well, uh, whether it's uh, getting approvals through GWA, uh, GPA, uh, EPA as well. Uh, I know there's uh, 
there's some holdups with EPA as well. So, you know, I don't know what, uh, what the holdups are. Uh, my father and other consultants deal with them on a daily basis. I know, but, uh, you know, I think from my understanding, it's, it's always a lack of uh, man, manpower to, to follow all the guidelines when you do apply for a zone use change or a height variance. You know, uh, so it's, it's always come down to, uh, to manpower, uh, the support for the GOEC on the backside uh, for DLM. Well, I'm happy to hear that if you're saying that they are meeting more regularly because the legislature just entertained uh, the passage of a bill um, to, to allow the construction of worker barracks housing with the explanation that the delay, including from the sector and the business community that was, rep- that was representing that interest, uh, that the Land Use Commission was not meeting in a timely fashion for them to move forward with the worker housing. So certainly if that's improved. Because I think it was just a month ago we addressed that. I, I'm very much not one for doing zone changes through the Guam legislature, primarily because I, I think there's key issues, as you discuss infrastructure and also, um, you know, quality of life issues. If the construction is not something compatible, uh, particularly if it's within a residential community, it's next to a school or things like that, depending on what's being built. I definitely think we need to go through the review process, but certainly there's no doubt the government of Guam can improve on that process so that everyone walking in and be it, you know, an individual resident trying to build a home and, and a small project, or it could be a larger development project. And, and you are right. Some of these key agencies, it's not so much that they, they don't want to do the work, but they don't have the, the personnel or expertise on board uh, to do it in, in a reasonable uh, time frame so that these projects can move forward. But uh, again, I, I appreciate your service. Uh, someone certainly of your expertise uh, being involved in, in, in these Public uh, commissions are very beneficial to, to the rest of us who are not uh, as well versed in here and overseeing to making sure that things are happening and certainly happening above board. So congratulations on your appointment and certainly look forward to working, uh, voting on your confirmation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask a question and comment. Thank you. Uh, this is Masi, Senator Brown. Um, we do have Speaker Therese Terlahi who has now joined us in the hearing room. So welcome speaker. Uh, Just wanted to give you any, an opportunity if you have any questions for the nominee. No, no questions. Uh, Thank you, but just wanted to extend my thanks to him for his willingness to uh, serve and uh, wish him the best. Thank you so much. Uh, So just to some information, we did send notices to Department of Revenue and Taxation uh, the chairperson on the, the Guam Real Estate Commission as well uh, for their testimony. So, um, you know, seeing that there are no other questions or testimonies at this time, I would like to thank uh, the nominee himself for his continued service and accepting the nomination and for his participation in this hearing today. So this is Masi and um, the hearing for the executive appointment of Mr. Richard T. Gutierrez uh, is now duly heard. So this is Masi and have a great day, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you. So the next item on this agenda is Bill 90-36COR, sponsored by Senator James C. Moylan. It's an act to amend Section 5248 of Chapter 5, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated, relative to requiring monthly reports and the justification summaries when purchases are made through sole source or emergency procurement process. So I'd like to um, invite the sponsor for a brief introduction. Uh, Senator Moylan, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thank you, colleagues, and those here uh, for the public hearing today on Bill 90-36. As Madam Chair, you read the uh, title of the bill. Basically, uh, we are looking at an adjustment to a report that we all recently received, um, an annual report dated March 15, 2021, uh, where the General Service Agency Uh, provides uh, through the speaker and the Guam legislature uh, the contracts on sole source procurement and emergency procurement. And the reports are a reflection of those that have have submitted their uh, procurements for from January 1st, 2020 through December 31st, uh, 2020. So by the first quarter, we get these reports as last year. 
Uh, we recognize after reviewing these reports, uh, which were not really specific on what we received, that a couple of things. Uh, the importance of having these reports submitted monthly would be uh, much better uh, than waiting for it for an entire year. In addition, um, we're, the bill also addresses to provide a summary, summary justifying uh, the reason for the procurement transaction and how they determine the sole source procurement or the emergency procurement in this chapter. So that's what the bill really uh, does, just two things, changes the reporting period from annual to monthly and, from, uh, and to further explain uh, the details on the justification for coming to the sole source or the emergency procurement uh, justification. Uh, this uh, should be able to allow uh, the legislature and others to review uh, these reports on a monthly basis so we can have more frequency and be able to really look at how uh, the taxpayer's money is being spent. And anything questionable that comes out upon about through these reports uh, versus waiting for one year to address something that has passed uh, a while back. So there will be greater transparency in moving this bill forward. And we're not, we are not taken away from the agency's authority uh, in pursuing a sole source or the emergency procurement, only uh, that we're requiring the report now to be monthly instead of annually. So just a brief introduction on the bill, Madam Chair, I'm looking forward to any conversation on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Moreland. So at this time, I, I would like to recognize um, Attorney Kono from uh, GSA, as well as Attorney Brown that are here today. Uh, if they have, um, they're here to answer any questions uh, or perhaps, perhaps provide testimony as well. Um, so, uh, if any of you would like to provide any comments or testimony regarding Bill 90-36, um, you are recognized, uh, Attorney Kono. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, we can't hear you if, you're, if you are speaking, but if you can turn on your um, video, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, but I do, uh, while he's um, setting up. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Attorney Kono. Um, is there a way we can see you visually uh, at this I time? I don't know. I don't know how. Okay, so maybe a just start my video. Yes, so there's a um, an icon. Oh, okay. right. Yes, but we had already submitted our comments on Bill 90-36. Uh, first, though, let me just say the uh, chief procurement officer asked me to sit in because she got called into a meeting. Okay, well, I appreciate your uh, taking the time. I know how busy you guys are there down there, so we do appreciate you uh, being being part present. Uh, yeah, so um, if you would like to, um, if you would like to say your comments, or I could just uh, do a par paraphrase of it. Um, if well, you the would, yeah. Were very simple. It was just that we. Uh, we recognize the, the request and we just want to point out that any additional work that's done is always going to be, there's always going to be a cost factor and the cost factor is it's going to take away from other work that we have to do by pointing someone else to put together the documentation. So it's going to take a little bit longer and we would uh, request that the legislature look at the requirements that they are putting upon us and and we would like to get more assistance. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think that's something I'm willing to, uh, I'm trying to work with uh, with your office uh, to, to uh, make sure you have the funding. And um, that's definitely important to help assist with this effort. Um, okay, and then uh, also um, we did send notices to DPW as well uh, so we're hoping to hear back from them since they are part of um, procurement of construction, as well as the Office of Public uh, um, Auditor's Office. Um, okay, so is there anyone else who would like to provide testimony on Bill 90-36? 
I don't see anybody at this time. But yes, I think it's it's really important, uh, especially in seeing the number of pro emergency procurements in the latest report. I believe there's over 300. Um, so that's, I think, a, a larger workload than, than previously. And the amount of sole source procurement, I think it's necessary to have a close eye on, on how this was um, processed, um, considering the, the value of, you know, over $16 million uh, were spent through this. And um, these type of procurements uh, generally, um, you know, can cost more, can, can you know, require a premium. Um, so we do appreciate your, your assistance with this. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor to my colleagues. Uh, Senator um, Tony Anna. No questions. Okay, Senator Pito Chalahi. If you have any comments or questions. None, okay. Uh, okay, I see we have uh, Attorney John Brown who uh, has um, come before us. If you have any comments or testimony provi uh, for this bill, you're, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, and uh, the rest of you as well. I, I take uh, to heart uh, um, Attorney Kono's comments about uh, resourcing this thing. You're, you're looking for monthly reports. It's going to be uh, 12 times more than what we're doing at the moment on a cost basis. Uh, I think it's well, my problem Sorry, is it Sorry, Attorney Brown, I think you're coming in. Um, uh, as I, as the connection is clear. Is that better? Uh, Okay, we just lost Attorney Brown. I think he's going to try to um, sign back on. Uh, we, we'll give him a, um, a couple minutes. Um, maybe we can recess for a moment. I'm sure my colleagues have questions for Attorney Brown. Maybe for a five minute recess.
Also made the Committee on Environment, Revenue Taxation, Labor Procurement, uh, Statistics Research and Planning is back from yeah. recess. Um, we left off with the, um, Attorney Brown uh, with his testimony or, or comment. So I would uh, like to welcome him to uh, provide his, his testimony. Uh, so Attorney Brown. Right, thank you. <clears throat> I was saying uh, that I uh, really appreciate um, Attorney Kono's comments about the cost effect that this will have. I mean, we're going from doing this one time a year to doing it 12 times a year. Um, and that's going to have some costs involved and they're not going to be able to do it any better than they're doing it now, which needs to be greatly improved now because the, the uh, report that I saw uh, in many, many cases just did not describe what the occasion was that justified sole source or emergency procurement. And both of those sections require specific determinations that it is the sole source or that it is an emergency. Uh, in order to proceed down those paths. So that information should be in the file. And why it isn't in the report is a, is a bit of a mystery. Uh, so I think that there's room to clean that up. And, uh, and perhaps we don't need it monthly, perhaps quarterly, but I agree that if you don't catch this pretty quickly in real time, it's a done deal. It's already happened and there's no way to correct it. And it needs to be corrected in real time. So, uh, but but it, I don't have any real problem with the substance of the of the bill. Okay. Well, thank you, Attorney Brown, for your uh, comments and testimony. Uh, so I'd like to um, uh, open up the floor to the rest of my colleagues, uh, Senator Torres, if you have any questions for the panel. Um, I don't have any questions, but. Um... Attorney Kono and Attorney Brown, you bring up some very practical um, implications of this legislation, which is what I had wondered too, because a sole source, uh, a sole source and an emergency are very specific types of circumstances, and uh, and uh, I, I know that there's there's there tends to be a need to know, and all of that, but you know that and and that would drive this type of legislation. But I want to ask you though. Um, Mr. Brown, is it is it um, is it a a, a a normal thing, or has it occurred in the past where people actually protest uh, sole source procurements, or or how does that usually work, or does it does it generally begin and end, and and there's not much to it? I, I don't recall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, my very first uh, procurement case back when I didn't even know procurement was a soul was a protesting of a sole source contract. Um, I, I won that eventually because there were other sources and it was known to them. Uh, and, and the events that came up following that eventually uh, then public auditor uh, Doris Brooks said, there is no full, full source. Just don't go there because um, it, it, it is so problematic and, and people just uh, abuse it. And they also abuse the emergency procurement. They're both, anytime you don't have competition, you're gonna have abuse. Uh, and neither one of those are competitive uh, source selection procedures. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it's that sort of thing um, that it, you, you, whether you wanna give the benefit of the doubt, the doubt it, it's always, um, it's always a, a, a situation when it's it, when it's a sole source in an emergency, especially, you know, it, it, it's kind of, um, yeah, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to reconcile that sometimes, because oftentimes you'll hear about it way after the fact, and it's like, how do you undo that? But uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was a, a curious thing, but I, I don't have any further questions. It's just a very interesting type of dilemma um, when you're trying to figure out what the what the cure for you know, potential problems or even past problems um, are and how to prevent it going forward is, it, that's always a million dollar question, but thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Senator Torres. Uh, Senator Brown, uh, if you have any questions to the panel. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I certainly uh, appreciate uh, Senator Moylan sponsoring this legislation because I think many of us certainly when we saw the listing, I mean, 27 pages of microprint of procurement uh, that has occurred with regards to um, 
you know, I'm sure most of it will be related to this time frame during this pandemic, but quite a substantial list. And I think it does raise that concern because as was previously discussed with regards to justifying sole source procurement, I mean, there has to be a, a very good valid reason as to why uh, one particular company is selected. Uh, of course, there are only certain companies that perhaps may do business with the government of Guam, but when you look at the what little information was provided on that list other than a list. I mean, you know, there should be a justification because we know there are many other companies on Guam in some cases that can provide a certain commodity or service, and yet it's listed as a sole source. Uh, and then also with regards to emergency procurement, I mean, we understand certainly the challenges that we've been through this past year. Uh, but again, that opportunity to abuse emergency procurement uh, by virtue of the fact that it can be claimed as an emergency and then you end up finding, you know, only certain companies, uh, even though we know other companies on Guam can provide that service without really, uh, you know, the report doesn't provide us any explanation as to why that particular company was selected over anyone else. And I don't think we should use these challenging times of emergencies uh, as a means to not follow a process that the public can be comfortable with to ensure that there's not abuse in the procurement process. I mean, I'm sure GSA and others that are involved will want to say that, you know, we followed all the proper steps. These are all good procurements and, you know, we're, we're not concerned because we followed all the steps. And yet for those of us on the outside, and certainly as a legislator looking at this, um, we have to ensure that good standards are followed because there's an awful lot of money involved. Let's get right down to it. There's an awful lot of money involved. And particularly under these circumstances right now that we're going through, it's an unusual situation because you have the executive by virtue of all this federal funding, having such control over vast amounts of money that are coming in on behalf of the people of Guam that the legislative body has no say in, or shall they say the legislative body has no say in how those funds are expended. Of course, it's our hope that those monies are being spent properly. Uh, but how do we know that? How do we have uh, some sense of comfort? How does the public have some sense of comfort with regards to that? So I think it does bring up questions. I, I don't agree that this is a more cumbersome process because I'm assuming if GSA has to continue to maintain a list of all their sole source procurements and their emergency procurements, all it means is that they start the list at the beginning of the fiscal year and each month provide that list with, with a summary explanation as required in the bill of information regarding that transaction. I mean, we were told when the question came up, I know when Speaker Tolahi had also raised the question uh, that the listing did not provide us any summary information with regards to these procurements that, you know, the response is, oh, it's going to be cumbersome to go back. They'd have to go back individually on each one of these cases to provide that information. And I would assume there should be a summary explanation that exists that simply could be reproduced and included in a packet and forwarded to the legislature or to anyone in the public who has an interest. Uh, because certainly to do sole source procurement, uh, you would have to have the head of that agency justify as to why uh, they're pursuing sole source procurement and not going through the regular, and it might not even be an emergency related matter. Why are they going through the sole source procurement process? So I think to, to move that cloud away of, uh, you know, concern, and I think it's significant concern. Uh, with regards to these type of issues. I think it's important that the information be readily available. And as, as was mentioned earlier, that, uh, you know, with as, as uh, Attorney Brown said, within a time sensitive manner so that we're aware of it because uh, months and year, a year later, what we're gonna go back and look at a procurement that occurred 12 months ago because the information just came to light publicly. Um, I'm very supportive of this legislation. I think anything that adds more transparency and accountability and sheds more light in how this government operates, and certainly more importantly, these funds that were intended, including CARES funding, that is intended for our people. Uh, it's a little hard to play around with that kind of money uh, if it becomes publicly known much quicker uh, how that money is being spent and, and ensure that there's accountability with regards to how that money is being spent because uh, I was not pleased looking at that extensive list. I'm sure perhaps GSA can justify every single procurement. Uh, but, but, you know, just looking at it, it, it raises questions. And the fact that summary explanations cannot be readily generated or reproduced and provided to the lawmakers um, is concerning. I don't see any reason why not. That, that summary page should exist in all these procurements, especially because it's being done outside of what you would call the norm of procurement. I did want to ask um, Attorney Brown with regards to that. Uh, as he mentioned a little earlier, perhaps that uh, maybe because these type of, you know, procurements can be problematic. What are his thoughts? Is this something that we actually need to have available 
as a process in government or, or is it something we should remove or what, what are his thoughts on how we can more effectively uh, have the government get the services or products that it needs, but, but, you know, do it in a way that, um, you know, we're not having walking around with a big question mark in our mind on what those processes are that currently exist. If he's able to respond to that. Uh, I, I can happily report that the emergency procurement statute was redrafted, rewritten and passed by, uh, I think it was the last legislature, uh, which makes it much more friendly to uh, the users of it, to the people who require it. And the current one requires that limit your uh, emergency procurements to 30 days supply. And that's it. Mm -hmm. and you can't do it again, you know, only one per emergency. Uh, well, this one allows, uh, now it's for 90 days, uh, but there's also a requirement that as soon as you uh, give effect to that, you award the contract, the emergency contract, you have a team that is planning to do a regular procurement of those sources so that you're not avoiding the competitive processes, other process, it, you're, and continuing to rely on an emergency after a while, when is an emergency still an emergency? You know, so th this, uh, this does speak to that. And I think that it's, it's a huge improvement. Uh, you're, uh, yeah, I guess I was gonna mention that because you're, you're, you were talking mostly about the emergency procurement. So source is always gonna be a problem. I think that uh, you start with the, uh, with uh, Doris Brooks's uh, statement that there is no sole source as your, as your working uh, idea and then see if you can prove it. Uh, but uh, we don't do an awful lot of that. There are occasions where sole source is really the, the only way you can go. Um, but that, that even can be smooth. Maybe you wait too much, you know, if, if you're not doing the market research to know what's available, and most places aren't, then uh, you can't even answer the question, the supposition, is this a sole source? Because you haven't done the research. So they need to have and keep uh, that research. One of the things that, uh, when I went through the annual report, uh, I wasn't certain that it covered all the agencies. You know, 50, uh, 5248 requires the CPO and Department of Public Works to issue that annual statement for everybody, for the entire territory. And it looked to me like I, I'm, I can, I can sit corrected, um, but it looked to me like uh, there are a lot of line, uh, uh, autonomous agencies uh, who uh, don't procure through GSA who were not involved in this, but they should be reported. And uh, I don't think they were. As I said, I, I, there, there are a lot of acronyms and stuff in there that I just wasn't familiar with, but uh, that, that's another improvement that's required. I wanted to ask one other question um, with regards, you mentioned with regards to sole source, and we've heard stories in the government that some of these uh, procurements for sole source have existed over a period of years with the same company. Um, you know, and you got to wonder about that, unless it's some really unique commodity that isn't available anywhere else. So there's only one company in all of Guam that's providing it. Um, do you think that's something that should be eliminated? And like you said, require that market research to be done and then determine if there's no other source. And I guess they can, if that's the one that's bidding or whatever, then that's who they can procure from, rather than how this in the past has become, you know, identifying selective companies. And that's the one company that can, can bring a certain commodity in because they're in favor with the government at the time. And I've, I've, I've known of that. And I, I, we've known it exists and we've known abuses and, and in substantial amounts of money. We're not talking hey, a few dollars here and there. We're talking hundreds and thousands of dollars uh, within a couple months, for example. And, and that just continues because that's their favorite, ben, you know, their favorite vendor. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thought is that's the, the, the um, beauty of this, this requirement in the first place, the one that we have now. If no changes were made to it, is that <laughs> even if once a year you're seeing the same product being purchased from the same sole source, at that point, somebody ought to be watching to say, well, is this still a sole source? We're not doing anything to go out. You know, we're supposed to go out and, and create competition where we can. Uh, and uh, that would, you know, that's 
that's the complete utility of this, this kind of reporting. So um, it is a problem. The, the, my first one as a sole source, it, it had been going on for five years and then they renewed it. <laughs> and, and in neither case, any competition, uh, uh, any comparative solicitation, although there were there was a sufficient uh, competition from other sources on island, available, willing and ready. Uh, so uh, it, 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 it exists. You know, and it would be fair to say there's, there's a lot of companies on Guam probably that don't even deal with the government just because of the hassle or even if they wanted to challenge, you know, if, if they were also a vendor probably with similar products or service. I'm sure some of them just don't want to want to challenge the government in fear of uh, being blacklisted or it's a costly project, you know, costly process for them to uh, even if they're going to appear before the public auditor at an issue or maybe ultimately take the issue to court. Uh, it can be very time consuming and very expensive. So it doesn't really leave the private sector parties a lot of uh, options uh, with regards to dealing with the government if, they, if they're dissatisfied. I mean, maybe bigger companies can, but you know, a, a smaller business, I think it'd probably be difficult for them in wanting to, uh, to even challenge the process or simply maybe say, I don't wanna deal with the government. And, and we know a lot of companies provide uh, good services out there, but some of them will tell you, I'm sorry, we don't do business with GovGuam. And I've encountered that just in my short time here at the Guam legislature, just getting my office set up of finding you know something that I need that is probably the, the lower price that I could I could want to purchase something here, uh, and then realize that you know we're sorry we don't we don't deal with Gov Guam you know I'm like okay well understandable but what, well, what uh, if I could ask that as my last question? Sure. Some of this not wanting to deal with the government has little to do to, or to nothing to do with the actual selection process the solicitation process. It has to do with the fact that the government doesn't pay time. Mm, that's that's a very important point. Yes, and and if that were done, we probably have a lot more competition than than, uh, than we are now enjoying, <laughs> or not enjoying. Uh, so that that's the main thing. Uh, the other thing is the competitors who might protest these things aren't aware of what's going on. Mm. Someone in the government should be aware of what's going on and put a spotlight on that. You know, the federal government, and we can't be them because they have a big budget and all that kind of stuff. But uh, every, every major division of every major agency has a competition officer whose job it is, is to make sure that there's adequate competition for every solicitation that they handle. Mm -hmm. And that's their job. So that's what they're looking for. That's what they're paid for is to find it. They don't, they're not paid for not finding stuff. So, uh, you know, if the government takes a little bit more interest in being aware of these things, making themselves, and this is, again, this is a spotlight right here. This, this report uh, should, should tell us an awful lot of uh, trails. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity, but you know, it's, it's ironic because one of the things you're required to do before you can go out on bid is you have to have the money available in order to do the bid. At least yeah. certainly being the head of an agency a few rounds, uh, that was a very basic requirement. You could not move forward to procurement unless funds had been identified uh, to pay for that procurement. So it seems kind of strange that uh, you know services are being procured and yet uh, timely payments are not being made to vendors when that's a very basic requirement so you have to wonder about that uh you know and un understandable but I, I think you're right we, we should be addressing timely payments so that um you know we have more competition and interest of private sector out there and wanting to deal with the government but thank you very much um, Attorney Brown, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, even though I don't always agree with the whole cumbersome process of procurement, the 120 something checklist you have to do. And because I've been certainly some of the presentations that you've made, I certainly appreciate your continued uh, support and interest in engaging with the government with regards to this issue. I, I think it's fair to say you're looked at as the authority, at least from the private sector, just because of your history of uh, uh, not just teaching these uh, courses and the modules to, to uh, our government employees that are required to have the modules, but just your continued interest in, in uh, assisting the government and providing greater awareness about the whole procurement process. So thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the indulgence of being able to ask these questions of Attorney Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. And thank you, uh, Attorney Brown, as well.
Um, I would like to recognize Senator Moyle. I do apologize. I was going to reserve you for last, but if you have any questions, if you would like to, um, you know, have your questioning at this time. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Let's see, Attorney Kono, I, I appreciate your uh, comments and testimonies. Thank, thank you for the submittal on that. And I, I can really say that uh, I'm sure even without uh, possibly this Bill 90 that uh, you would agree your department, GSA, needs, some, needs additional help with or without this bill. Uh, we, you need more personnel. You've been short. I'm not sure how long. And you'll probably continue to be short unless um, this include in your budget the opportunity to hire more people. Uh, the, the federal government has given us over $600 million. And I can, I can just imagine how much procurement is is going to be done that's going to come across your desk. Uh, so I, I have no disagreement and I would support the additional help necessary. But I, I would have to say that um, uh, it's not necessary. It's your increase in manpower would probably be more of your current responsibilities, not necessarily just because of Bill 90, uh, but because of your of what you must produce. Uh, to provide the services for the government of Guam and getting the procurement things uh, going. Um, going back to this, uh, the uh, report itself, uh, which how it comes out to us, it, it really does not provide uh, information we need. And as the legislatures, we really had to scrutinize uh, the sole source and the emergency uh, procurement uh, as well. So we will need additional information. And hopefully um, through the system, this will provide, provide that for us. Uh, in an earlier uh, interview with um, the chief procurement officer, uh, Claudia Faji, uh, she said, this is a systems generated report. Uh, so uh, it, it will produce, uh, it just needs to be reprogrammed to instead of quarter, I'm sorry, instead of annually, it will be monthly, a monthly report that is just in the system that it can produce. Um, will we have further questions about this? Well, most, most likely after we get the reports on a timely basis as uh, Attorney Brown has uh, discussed, but it would also give us the opportunity to address things right away. And in the bill also, it, it requires a summary justif justifying that, uh, which is in the description clause here, uh, which we can probably go through and, and uh, and make sure it's it's written written better so we can address. So I, I just wanted to uh, say uh, to Attorney Kono there that uh, yes, I do support that you additional staff and I, and I think now is a great time for the Chief Procurement Officer through DOA uh, to request for this and see how uh, possibly the uh, the American Relief uh, monies can. Uh, can assist in hiring because you're going to have additional workload. Whether Bill 90 gets passed or not, you will see additional workload that, as for sure. So I, I just wanted to give those comments before I give my closing remarks after that. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moreland. Senator Tidegui, you're recognized. To just Masi, Madam uh, Chair, and I apologize for stepping out um, earlier, uh, stepping away. Um, uh, so I'm hoping that uh, these questions that I have are not redundant <laughs> and it hasn't been asked. So I, I do have a question with regards to um, uh, GSA and um, that is uh, our emergency and sole source, procure sole source procurement transactions subject to annual, which is subject to annual um, audits by the Office of Public Accountability. And does it, and does a mechanism exist at GSA or at any of the other agency levels allowing for regular monitoring of these transactions to protect against potential fraud and abuse? This is for Mr. Attorney Kono. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, Attorney Kono. Right. As yep. to your first question regarding whether OPA reviews or not reviews, uh, it, 
they can come in and review anything. Okay. So have they in the past looked at our soul scores and emergency procurements? Yes, they have as part of their regular review of audits. Right, and, and they come in annually to review, you know, the OPA does, but d is there a mechanism that already exists at GSA or at, at an agency a le level allowing for regular monitoring of these transactions to protect the potential fraud and, and, and abuse? I'm sorry, I do not understand the question very well. Uh, could okay. you kindly repeat it? So the Attorney General's office goes in annually to review, you know, um, the sole source procurements, you know, that, that we received recently. But is there something already that a mechanism that exists already at GSA that monitors these transactions monthly, you know, or regular on a regular basis, uh, if not at GSA, at the agency level, when allowing for these uh, uh, purchases, you know, it, that way, you know, it's at least you're on top of it to protect any kind of potential fraud or, or abuse. It sounds self self serving, but we do try to look at any requests provided by an agency for anything over ten thousand dollars at the moment, because we handle things over ten thousand. Under is handled by the agency themselves uh, for whether or not something is sole source or emergency. We need to find out their justification, and we determine if it's correct or not or we agree with it or not. So at the first stage, we do try to uh, review what an agency provides as their justification. And we do not always agree with them. Hmm. Okay, I, I don't think you're, you're getting what I'm trying to ask. Uh, and, and that is just, you know, reports, not just summaries, but reports that are issued out monthly to review on these uh, procurements, you know, through sole source sourcing um, mm -hmm. is my question. And, and it's not being answered because uh, GSA, I'm, I'm sure you, you keep records um, every time there's something that comes in that's like you said, over $10,000, you keep records of it and you should have this report generated monthly on whatever comes in. Um, at least, you know, I'm hoping at least G GSA has some kind of, um, you know, mechanism to do that monitoring of these and, and can pull these records at a, at, a, at a whim, you know, I mean, if you were to be um, FOIA'd at, at any time to request for a record. So I, I just, uh, I, I don't want to continue if, if he keeps answering it. Go ahead. Uh, Senator, yeah, Senator Tadu, if I may. Um, so yeah, this, there's a position that is needed that hasn't uh, been filled and that's the a compliance officer. Um, and this is something that we brought up in the past um, uh, with, with the director to see if they can fill positions in addition to filling more buyer positions. Um, there, there definitely is um, you know, a critical shortage within GSA. And what this compliance officer position would do, it would do that very thing. It would help to ensure that um, you know, the procurement is done properly. And so, yeah, we're dealing with many issues as far as, uh, you know, oversight, uh, whether it's the legislation or whether it's just the staffing itself. And um, so, yeah, this is uh, critical, especially now when we're going into budget. I think it's important that um, the budget cycle, right? I think it's important to really uh, advocate for these positions. Um, mm -hmm. So I would like to uh, yep. set opportunity to be a say. Yep. And to work with thank, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do. I am aware of the shortage there. Um, those who have, uh, have left GSA, I've, I've heard that um, it's a uh, it's very hard to retain those uh, individuals at that agency. Uh, they're being, you know, requested at other agencies for a higher pay, and so I do understand the, the shortage. But you know, record keeping is you know fundamental, and and it's it's needed at all times. You know, regardless. Um, you need to cross your T's and dot your I's and have it all recorded um, uh, as you have nothing else to, to report on, you know, and 
Um, so it, it's just, uh, there, there is also a shortfall uh, at GSA with regards to this, but you know, at a um, agency level, there should also be that type of uh, requirement of regular monitoring on these and providing that information to GSA on a monthly basis. And maybe it's as simple as putting it into a computer or a spreadsheet, you know, from each agency to monitor this. And instead of waiting until the end of the year, you know, uh, for this type of uh, information, you know, it's, it's talking about when it, in, in this legislation, I think where it says summary, you know, I think it's important that we, we and, and Mr. Brown, if, if I may, the difference between, as an attorney, the difference between the summary um, and, and a report, uh, what would you say would be a, a better uh, verbiage, you know, to require this kind of report, you know, <laughs> instead of a summary? Uh, you know what I'm saying here? Yeah, uh, I think that um, it's not necessary to have more of a summary than is asked for in the statute. Mm -hmm. But we don't get that. <laughs> we don't even get that. We get a, a bare conclusion. We needed it because it was an emergency. Okay. Uh, you know, so uh, we needed it because we couldn't get it anyplace else. What have you done to look anyplace else? What was the nature of the emergency? Uh, and so I, I think that this, not, this is not to meant to be an audit report. This is meant to be a, uh, an alarm bell mm -hmm. uh, so that you then dig deeper. Uh, and this has the potential for, for being that if we just follow through. And also, I, I would really like to know whether this is information that all agencies on Guam are uh, experiencing, or is this only the stuff that goes through GSA? Right. Yeah, that's, the, that statute, was the statute requires the CPO to, to report this stuff. So they must then have to collect that stuff. Uh, exactly. And or that's we what I, to the other agencies as well. Is, yeah, and that's, and, and that's what my question was, not over at, not just at GSA, but at an agency level, you know, this type of monitoring. Um, monitoring. Um, so Mr. Brown, um, I, I greatly appreciate you always being here and, and you know, giving your time um, and service to helping uh, the legislature when it comes to procurement. Uh, the, I do have a question for you. Will the non-compliant compliance with the provisions proposed in Bill 90-36 result in the responsible procurement officer being charged with perjury? And if not, is the bill as drafted sufficient to hold a person's person or persons liable for non-compliance? So basically in G, uh, 5 GCA 52050, it requires the responsi responsible procurement officer to certify in writing under penalty of perjury that he or she may maintain the record required by 5 GCA 5249, which includes 5249E, the requesting agency's determination of need. So do you think, well, Will non-compliance with this provision proposed in, nine, in Bill 90-36 result in responsible procurement uh, officer being charged with pen, uh, perjury? And if not, no. yeah, okay. Is this bill, is, is this bill as drafted sufficient to hold persons liable for non-compliance? Uh, I don't think that if you start doing that, you you still got a procurement law. You're you're delving in delving into criminal activity, crim, uh, or uh, the kind of stuff that is a civil complaint where someone uh, is founded with funds. Uh, those things don't have a place in procurement. We we don't want to be bogged down in all that stuff. We got enough stuff to do just to put the put the uh, goods on the table. Uh, and uh, I don't think that, you know, Mr. Kono's uh, talking about, uh, you know, we're going to need more sources, but we, they would need a whole lot more if they were then to go after every perjury uh, that the government commits. And I've seen a few yeah. of those myself, uh, but they, they're not. But that's why we have the, the uh, protests. The protest is the only way that we get real time policing of what's, go what's actually happening in procurement. And what we've done, and it's been very effective, is to outsource that policing to the private sector. The private sector is not going to do it unless it's effective use of their time. So we can't 
stand in the way of those protests getting handled with integrity and efficiently. Uh, so uh, otherwise you are relying on the attorney general's office to, to become more involved. I see. Okay. Well, th thank you for that insight. And I, and I appreciate what, what you have to say, but sometimes, you know, you need a, um, something in place to, to ensure that it, it's done before you even attempt to do any kind of <laughs> uh, process, you know, going forward that you follow the law. And if you don't, there are going to be repercussions. You know, and, and sometimes people just tend to do that, knowing that it's not even going to be a slap in the hand. You know, it's just, oh, it's just a simple protest and we're not, we're, you know, let's see if we can get away with it. You know, and what we want to do is, is, is stop that practice that's been going on, you know, letting people try and try to see if they can get away with something. So um, I appreciate your time as well. And thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak on this legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Attorney Brown. And uh, Robert Cohn, thank you so much as well. Thank you, Senator Tadeke. Uh, just a, a couple quick questions for Attorney Kono. So how much do you staff would you need uh, to carry out um, you know, the uh, mandate of this bill? Uh, should it be passed? Or would you um, task another buyer uh, to do this activity? Or do you see uh, perhaps, um, you know, I know there's a system that's the updating of the system or, or a pro reprogramming it. Uh, how much funding would you need to um, appropriately implement this bill? Well, I, I see this is more of an administrative action rather than a buyer action because the buyer put the information into the system, but gathering it is more of a, uh, seems to me more of an administrative action. But in terms of people, I would say we would need at least, uh, uh, one more administrative person for this. Okay. Um, and then regards to um, the report itself, I mean, is there an easy fix to, you know, produce reports that can provide greater detail, such as um, determination of need uh, for both of these types of procurement? Is that something that can be done easily or do you have to contract that out? Or, um, you know, what do you see as the resources that are needed? Well, the determination need would be, basically when the uh, request comes in by an agency as to their determination. And I assume that's what you would want on your report. But uh, so it's just a matter of combining everything at some point to get it all done. That's, um, okay. yeah. And is there, is there a process in place to digitize uh, uh, like the procurement records? Um, our our records are already, everything comes in on what they call the on-base system. Okay. So first you send in your requisition and all supporting documentation into our system. We receive that and then we go from there in terms of trying to find buyer uh, bidders uh, to submit or uh, trying to get quotes. All of that is in the system. Correct, but um, to have access for the public, is that- Access uh, to the public? Can the public easily access this information if they would like to, uh, I guess, see <clears throat> more information? I, I would not recommend the public getting it because I'm worried about security. Okay. But as regards to uh, like determination of need, is that something that could be perhaps uh, placed on a website, You know, kind of like similar to what other agencies have? Um, you know, regards to minutes of meetings or, um, you know, other, other things. Uh, is this something that could be perhaps uh, developed at GSA? I assume it could be. All right, um, all right thank you. Um, so now I'd like to recognize um, Senator Moreland for his closing. Uh, Madam Chair, can I... Can I share my thoughts? Oh, of course, Senator Pito. Okay, I, first off, I, I, I wanna, I'm in support of Bill 9036, a COR, and I wanna thank uh, the author of the bill. But there's something that I have in my mind on in as far as purchasing authority. And I guess 
Senator uh, Larry Torres uh, uh, knows about this. And we're, we're, what I'm trying to do is give the mass transit authority to make their own purchases. And that's because I have no qualms with GSA. But my problem is, you know, the mass transit authority, the bulk of the money that comes into mass transit authority is, is federal funds. And the only reason why I wanted to initiate some kind of bill to expedite the purchasing uh, because of the timeline that these federal funds is available. And I'm just afraid that if we don't have, uh, if we don't give the mass transit authority, um, you know, to do their own purchasing, uh, it might defeat the purpose of getting that federal funds. And I, there's like $9 million right now on hold. And uh, I just wanted to find out from Mr. Kono if if uh, if that thing would 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 suffice if I do uh, do a bill and have master authority just do their own purchase purchasing to to expedite you know whatever they need uh, and most of the money is going to be spent uh, spent on infrastructure and transportation so I just wanted to find out from uh, Mr. Kono uh, is that. Uh, appropriate uh, to do or is it is it possible that we can do that well it's always possible that you can pass a bill to take out grta from uh, the generalized uh, procurement and make it a uh, what uh, somewhat like some autonomous agencies have However, because i know that autonomous agencies some of the autonomous agencies does have that uh yeah. that people However, I, 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 if you're asking why is there a delay, I would suggest that it's not GSA in the delaying of procuring. If the delay is in the GRTA submission of documentation and other issues relating to their purchases. Sorry, uh, so, thank you. I just, uh, if I can interject, uh, Senator Pito, I do appreciate, I know we have a, uh, you know, GSA here to provide testimony for Bill 90-36, and I do appreciate your interest, and I hope we can, you know, table this discussion for uh, perhaps an informational hearing, which I plan to, or oversight hearing, at which I plan That's to. That's fine, uh, Manager. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, though, for your uh, concern. Uh, Senator um, James Moylan, if uh, you'd like to close on your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> thank you, Attorney uh, Brown and uh, Attorney Kono for your testimony and thank you to my colleagues for our questioning. Um, again, as, as a summary and in closing, we're discussing the sole source and emergency procurement report, which we know we on March 15th, we, we received the latest report on last year's information, just this year. Uh, when we reviewed those reports, we saw some red flags that many of our senators were interested in finding out more about. This bill allows us to look at these reports on a monthly basis, not on an annually basis. So we can quickly go back and see and learn what the sole source or the emergency procurement was all about. And if we need an oversight hearing to address it, to protect the taxpayers' money, then that's what we need to do. So this, is, this bill is about transparency and, and helping us monitor the money. Uh, last year's report was based on 117, uh, looked at $117 million coming in from the CARES Act. If, by passing this bill, and I think it should be a, um, a priority because we know we're expecting over 660 million or close to that with the American Recovery Plan. If we're going to be expected to wait one year uh, for a report next March 15, 2021, to look at purchases, then I think we're already way behind. And we, where we could have corrected some issues ahead of time and looked at things that are important. Uh, for example, um, on an executive order 202044, 20, the governor has, uh, item number three, the governor has 
uh, noted in the executive order, emergency procurement for financial and human resource management system. I can imagine the amount of money that will be invested in this and it could be helpful for the island, but I think we should be on top of this. We recognize the emergency management system is going to be very expensive and also very important to, to have. But the fact that it's on an executive order for emergency procurement could be questionable or it could be the right thing to do, but we need to address this uh, right away. And moving bill uh, 94 to allow this body uh, to review sole source and uh, emergency procurements on a monthly basis, I think is the right thing to do. And we provide the support that GSA needs, uh, then that, that will be the right thing to do a, as well. But whether, whether it be this bill or another bill, uh, GSA needs support now. And so I'm hoping this bill would also assist them in getting that support as well. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel uh, for uh, the public hearing today on Bill 90-36. Thank you very much. This is Mossy, Senator Moylan. Um, and um, so uh, there being that there are no other testimonies or questions, uh, Bill 90-36 COR, uh, sponsored by Senator James Moylan is duly heard. So now at this time, I would like to switch the agenda because we do have members present that are waiting. Um, we don't have anyone here to testify in Bill 65 at this time. So we're going to switch it up to Bill number 70-36 COR. Uh, it's a bill sponsored by Senator Amanda L. Shelton, co-sponsored by Senators Talina Cruz Nelson, Tina Rose Mooney Barnes, Mary Camacho Torres, and Joanne Brown to act to add a new section 5013 and 5012 to Part A of Article 1, Chapter 5, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated relative to adopting a procurement policy in favor of women-owned businesses and to cite this act as a Support for Women-Owned Businesses Act. I would like to invite the sponsor of this bill to provide opening statements. Uh, Senator Shelton, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Day and good morning, and I thank you for convening this public hearing and for the opportunity to speak on this bill. It's no secret that women's underrepresentation in prev is prevalent across many societal sectors, most notably in our island's economy. And amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, economic recovery lies at the forefront of our island's priorities. Bill number 71, or the Support for Women-Owned Businesses Act, seeks to address this gap by adopting a policy that prioritizes women-owned businesses under the government of Guam procurement process. As long as these businesses adhere to the criteria set forth by the U.S. Small Business Administration or the Guam Economic Development Authority, government entities must procure supplies and services from these businesses, provided the costs incurred are not more than 105% of the lowest bidder. Women-owned businesses have been at a distinct disadvantage in Guam's economy. A review of data from the 2017 Economic Census of Guam conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau confirms that the percentage of women-owned businesses is only about 17 percent. And according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the number of women-owned businesses who ranked their businesses' health as somewhat or very good dropped three times more than male-owned companies during the pandemic. Subsequently, women owners were much, like, much, much less likely to report future success concerning revenue, investment, and staffing. Eligible businesses must meet the following criteria. The business must be licensed to do business on Guam. The business must be located on Guam. The business is at least 51% owned by women. The business is certified as a woman-owned small business or an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business by the U.S. Small Business Administration, and the business is owned by individuals who have filed tax returns on Guam for at least three consecutive years. History shows us that supporting our community means supporting our women, and we must overcome the economic setbacks that have significantly affected our women-owned businesses. This bill is a step in the right direction to reflect our island's progress in women empowerment and to ensure an equitable business environment for all. 
So to us, Masi, Madam Chair, for this opportunity. And I'd like to thank our partners at the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce for their support and partnership uh, to help move this bill forward. And of course, to my colleagues, the co-sponsors uh, of this bill for your support as well. So to us, Masi. Thank you, uh, Senator Shelton. Uh, now I'd like to recognize those that have come here to testify. Um, uh, I, I recognize uh, Jane Flores from the Women's Affairs. Sorry, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I always forget that part. Um, thank you so much, Senator Perez. Um, I, as you mentioned, I'm Jane Flores, the director of the Bureau of Women's Affairs, and I also serve on the board of directors of the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'm testifying. Uh, we also have the Women's Chamber testifying today, but I'm testifying as director of the Bureau of Women's Affairs. And the BWA is proud to provide the following testimony in full support of bill number 7136. Public Law 2123, which established the Bureau of Women's Affairs in 1991, listed as one of the duties for this agency to review and submit recommended legislation to the legislature addressing the gender inequities in current law. The Guam Code Annotated currently contains a statute giving a slight local procurement advantage of 105% above the lowest price bidder for, bidder for local service disabled veteran-owned companies, as does a mirroring federal statute. However, Guam currently has no local statute mirroring the Federal Small Business Administration statute giving women-owned small businesses the same slight procurement advantage of 105% above the lowest price bidder for government of Guam contracts. Bill 7136 would rectify that inequity in our local statute. The International Finance Corporation of the World Bank Group in data compiled between 2011 and 2015 noted several reasons why investing in women's entrepreneurship worldwide is good for business and essential for economic growth. Women were the fastest growing market segment. They started businesses at a higher rate than men and were expected to create approximately 50% of new small business jobs by 2018. And a 2018 analysis by the nonprofit startup accelerator Mass Challenge reported that firms started by women did better financially on average than those started by men. However, a 2015 SBA report noted that women owned businesses are 21% less likely to win contracts compared to otherwise small, similar firms not owned by women. Of course, in 2020, all of this previous data. And these estimates were shattered by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Myriad sources, research entities, government and nonprofit studies, and many media outlets have documented the fact that this pandemic has hit women in the workforce harder. Layoffs have devastated employment sectors dominated by women, leisure and hospitality, education and health services, and real, and real retail trade. These are sectors with jobs in which working from home is largely impossible. This fact combined with the closure of schools, daycare centers and senior citizen centers has laid the brunt of the pandemic economic de devastation largely at the feet of women. A recent University of Guam study on the economic impact of COVID-19 on our economy noted that those most affected by this pandemic include Chamorro women under 40 years old. The closure of the island's 46 daycare centers last year affected the ability of one or both parents of nearly 3,000 young children to go back to work. The UOG study also notes that mostly women are having to spend 22 hours or more per week assisting their children with public school online education. The Guam Department of Labor reports that over half of the cumul cumulative total number of persons receiving unemployment compensation through December 31st, 2020, 53% were female. The percentage of women receiving unemployment checks in the weeks from June through December 2020 ranged from 54.6 to 57.5%. In November 2020, United Nations Women Deputy Director, Executive Director Anita Batia warned that a year of the pandemic could wipe out 
25 years of progress on gender equality. Other estimates of setbacks to women in the workforce range from 10 years to decades. In fact, US News and World Report reported just last month that the labor participation rate for women in February 2021 was 55%, 55.8%. This is the lowest level for working women in the US in 34 years. Evidence that women-owned businesses on Guam need assistance is found in the legislative intent and findings of this bill. The Guam Department of Labor's 2017 Economic Census of Guam reported that the percentage of women-owned businesses on island is ranging from between only 9 to 22 percent, depending on the industry. With Bill 7136, Guam has an opportunity to invest in local women-owned businesses by providing them with the slight advantage they may need in order to recover from the pandemic and flourish. Not only will this legislation help women-owned businesses procure local government contracts, but also helping these businesses will help our economy to recover. Because as history has shown us, when you invest in the women in a community, the entire community benefits. But don't just take my word for it. United Nations Deputy Secretary General Asha Rose Migiro told the International Women Leaders Global Security Summit in 20, 2007 that study after study has shown that when women are fully empowered and engaged, all of society benefits. Also in a 2015 presentation entitled Unlocking Markets for Women to Trade, Arancha Gonzalez, the Executive Director of the International Trade Center wrote, when women earn an income, they spend a higher proportion of it than men do on their children's health, food, and education, a trend which, if encouraged, can help break intergenerational cycles of poverty. Evidence also suggests that countries which provide more economic opportunities for women, including entrepreneurship, are more competitive in the global economy. Guam needs to be more competitive internationally. We all know this and we need to break our cycle of poverty. Bill 7136 is a start to helping our community do both. Finally, Senator Perez, Sijus Masi for providing this bill with a public hearing. Senator Amanda Shelton, I especially want to thank you as chair of the Legislative Committee on the Advancement of Women for introducing this bill and the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce, Vice Speaker Tina Munya Barnes and Senator Talina Nelson for collaborating on this legislation to provide local women-owned businesses with a set-aside procurement advantage. I also thank Senators Mary Torres and Joanne Brown for signing on as co-sponsors. C.J. Smasi for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. And I also would like to take just a moment, if I could, to pay tribute to former Speaker Joe T. St. Augustine. I remember him as a, a wise statesman and a compassionate advocate for the people of Guam. When I was a young reporter on Guam, he was always so willing to explain things to me and to help get the message out about what he was trying to do for the people of Guam. He will be missed. Thank you. This is me. Mm -hmm. This is me. 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 This uh, good morning, Senator Perez. Uh, I will be speaking on behalf of our GWCC President, Laura Nelson Cepeda, um, who did have to jump off earlier today. Uh, I am Renee Logie, the Executive Director for the Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce. And I'd just like to note that we do represent interests of over 200 members of women in our various capacities in our business community, which includes owners, managers, and employees. The Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce is proud to provide the following testimony in full support of Bill Number 7136. Senator Perez, the GWCC would like to thank you for providing public hearing for this bill today. We also want to thank Vice Speaker Tina Mooney Barnes and Senator Amanda Shelton, Chair of the Legislative Committee on the Advancement of Women, and Senator Talina Nelson for meeting with us about the idea of mirroring federal legislation in order to provide local women-owned businesses with set-aside procurement advantage. Senator Shelton, thank you for taking the lead and in introducing this important piece of legislation. And Senators Mary Torres and Joanne Brown, thank you as well for signing on with Senator Shelton, the Vice Speaker, and Senator Nelson as co-sponsors. 
It is well documented by local, national, and international sources that the COVID-19 pandemic has had much more detrimental effect on women in the workforce than their male counterparts. Many research and nonprofit organizations, as well as major media outlets, have reported on different aspects of this fact. From employment sectors, heavily dominated by female employees being shut down to close daycare and senior centers, most of this burden falls on the females in today's society. The Pew Research Center reports that three employment sectors, leisure and hospitality, education and health services, and retail trade accounted for 59% of the total loss of jobs from February to May 2020. These three particular sectors accounted for 40%, 47% of jobs held by women compared with 28% for men. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics affirms that pandemic unemployment has hit hardest in restaurants and other retail establishments, hospitality, and healthcare industry sectors. Again, the main sectors in which women's employment is most concentrated. Here on Guam, our data supports the fact that women have taken the brunt of economic losses caused by the pandemic. The Guam Department of Labor reports that 53% or over half of the cumulative total number of persons receiving unemployment compensation from the inception of the program through December 31st, 2020 were female. The percentage of women receiving unemployment checks in the weeks from June through December, 2020 ranged from 54.6% to 57.5%. The Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce has had a seat at the table of the governor's pandemic reopening advisory council since its inception. One of the loudest pleas from our GWCC members and from female employees in general on the island was that until daycare centers and schools fully reopened, it was and still is very difficult for employees, especially female employees, to go back to work. But that is only half of the story. Even as women are overrepresented in the unemployment or reduction of hours crisis caused by the pandemic, they have been chronically underrepresented as owners in Guam's business community. To share some more recent and local data, data, we received new information from Dean Santos from a research study conducted by Dr. Jones and Maryland Associates. This is part of a three-part project funded by our government to SBPA for our Guam Recovery Initiative. A few of the items documented are that the most affected by COVID-19 are Chamorro women under 40, those with a high school education or less and making less than 20,000 a year, Nearly 43% of residents affected with COVID-19 received food donations. Those living in a single family detached homes or apartment buildings, condos with seven persons or more, and spending 22 hours or more assisting their children in public schools and online education. As Bill 7136 mentions, the Guam Department of Labor's 2017 Economic Census of Guam confirms that the percentage of women-owned businesses on island has ranged from between 9% to 22%, depending on the industry. With regard to industry categorization, in 2017, women-owned businesses represented only 9% of local construction businesses, 19% of local manufacturing and retail businesses, 17% of local companies, oh sorry, 17% of wholesale businesses, 13% of local finance and insurance businesses, and 18% of local real estate companies. As, ex as expected, the highest percentage of local women-owned businesses, still only 22% is in the category of local healthcare companies. Additionally, data gathered from the 2010 Guam census reveals that on average in 2009, men were paid a higher wage than women. While we can hope that the 2020 census data reveals progress with regard to the advancement of women-owned businesses and the gender pay gap on island, Unfortunately, most of current data with regard to women's progress in the business world reveals that the pandemic has dealt our gender a serious setback. According to a March 8th, 2021 US News and Report article, the labor participation rate for women was 55.8% in February, 2021. That is the lowest level of women working in the US since 1987, which was 34 years ago. UNWomen.org notes that lost jobs and income loss today will have a snowball effect on the lives of women and girls for years to come. The organization reports that impacts on education and employment have long lasting consequences that if unaddressed will reverse hard won gains in gender equality. 
The internationally renowned accounting firm Deloitte reports that nearly 70% of women interviewed who said they've experienced adverse changes to their lives during the pandemic believe these shifts have prevented or will prevent them from progressing. One of the UN's recommendations for is for governments to provide support for women-owned and women-led businesses, quote, through specific grants and stimulus funding, as well as subsidized and state tax loans. Tax burdens should be eased, and where possible, governments should source food, personal protection equipment, and other essential supplies from women-led businesses. Bill 7136 not only mirrors the U.S. Small Business Administration's federal set-aside for women-owned businesses with 105% lowest bid price advantage, but it will also provide local women-owned businesses with the help they need not so much to get ahead, senators, but to regain lost economic ground and stay afloat. The one suggestion GWCC has for the legislation would be to consult with both the Guam Economic Development Authority and the Guam Department of Revenue and Tax as to which agency can be the determining agency for a local women-owned small businesses designation. To become federally certified as a women-owned small business with the US SBA may prove to be a daunting effort for a small local women-owned business. Allowing for a special, specific local only designation option through DRT, which issues Guam Business License or GITA, which handles local business programs, may prove to be a more viable option for a women-owned small business than just wants to conduct business with the government of Guam. The 36th Guam legislature is the second in Guam's history to host a female majority. Senators, the GWCC urges you to continue to shatter glass ceilings by becoming leaders in the effort to help local women own small businesses and women in general to recover from this pandemic. 27 years ago, the United Nations Population Fund recognized that the empowerment and autonomy of women and the improvement of their political, social, economic, and health status is a highly important end in itself. It is essential for the achievement of sustainable development. Former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan said, when women thrive, all of society benefits and the succeeding generations are given a better start in life. The Guam Women's Chamber of Commerce urges you to help make these quotes reality for our society here on Guam, starting with the passage of Bill 7136. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today in support of women-owned businesses on Guam. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Logie, for your testimony and the testimony of Guam Women's Chamber. Uh, we do appreciate that. Um, uh, so uh, now I'd like to uh, open the floor to Attorney Brown if he would like to provide testimony for Bill 71-36. Thank you again, Madam Chairwoman and Senators and uh, other people who are here in testimony today. I don't think we're going to see much of a big divergence from me. Uh, I am here in my own personal capacity and offer my personal comments. And I'm generally supportive of the bill. Uh, the notion of preference for particular classes of businesses that have been at a distinct disadvantage to the larger demographics of Guam's businesses is not new. It's not geographically constrained. Other instances of reports and stuff from around the world have already been uh, mentioned by prior speakers. Uh, more to the point of this bill though, which is a procurement law provision, this provision, this bill recognizes the principle of government contracting law. It's uh, Professor Stephen Schooner of the George Washington University Law School and a world recognized authority in things procurement wrote an essay at the beginning of this millennia entitled Desiderata, Objectives for a System of Government Contract Law. It was his goal to attempt to describe general aspirations for a procurement system before drafting begins. So we know where we're headed. It was a litany of commonly accepted universal fundamental principles, purposes, and policies of government contracting, what we call uh, procurement, feds call government contracting. He specifically spoke to nine goals, frequently identified for government procurement systems. First, competition. Second, integrity. These are all principles that a, uh, a, a uh, successful 
procurement uh, government procurement system will have. Competition, integrity, transparency, efficiency, customer satisfaction, best value, wealth distribution, risk avoidance, and uniformity. This bill fits within one of those, and I'll get to that in a second. He asserted that while each of these principles is important in its own right, the three pillars of good procurement system uh, are transparency, integrity, and competition. And he made the point that no one principle of the bunch was sufficient in and of itself, one way or another, to guarantee a successful procurement system. For instance, if transparency is taken to an extreme, all cards would be disclosed and laid out on the face, uh, face out on the table for every bidder or offer or to pursue, peruse. That degree of transparency is antithetical to con commerce and no one would compete to offer all the many things and services government requires if transparency was required of the procurement system like that. You know, uh, commerce takes place with all cards held close to the chest. Uh, he said that uh, in concluding this discussion about the, the ethical, the principles uh, of uh, a procurement system, he said no system can achieve all of these goals, nor can they, a state expect that its objectives for, for its own system will remain constant over time. Because no system can achieve all the goals here, or the many that aren't discussed. Your desiderata entails important trade-offs. And some you can't have it all. Addressing each and all of these principles is a weighing game. If you tip the scales in favor of one principle over another, you diminish the other. And you must understand that every time you change our procurement law, because you can wreck it if you're not that you're not careful to watch that balancing process. I've seen way too many bills that in a sentence or two would wreck the whole edifice of the procurement law. But this bill is not one of those. This bill fits one of those nine principles that Schooner had specified, which he refers to as wealth distribution. His notion of wealth distribution is not some kind of Robin Hood pejorative. It's a simple truth. Government needs many things and spends a lot of money getting them. And good governance is always in the shortest supply. Some leveling of the playing field at an economically social time, place, and cause can serve one of the main abiding features of democratic government purchasing, benefiting the wider community. That's what I think of as good governance. What we do, we should do for the whole community, not just for private enterprise or just for uh, government ownership and uh, exercise of their authorities. But this weighing process is, says that if you have too much of a good thing, like wealth distribution, then the rest of it, it, it will become an unrequited love affair with that system. There will be uh, an abuse of it, as we've seen with earlier today with uh, discussions on sole source and emergency procurement. So this notion of engaging women in government com commerce has been found to be a good idea at the US federal level. Uh, There's a paper written during the Clinton administration entitled a federal procurement policies and practices, which talks about bringing women into the, the uh, government contracting process. Canada in 2009, uh, had a report saying procurement strategies to support women-owned enterprises. Canada's aware of it. South America has an inter South American body that wrote a, a, a study, a paper uh, entitled Public Procurement as a Tool for Inclusion. So this is not, and it goes around the world. I mean, you find stuff like this in Europe, Australia, Africa, 
this is we're not breaking any new ground here. In fact, I'm mindful that um, uh, my own employer is owned by a woman, and and the CEO is a woman. It's not new on Guam. It can't be new on Guam since the heritage of Guam is a matrilineal society. So wisely, this bill does not hoe any new ground. It sticks substantively to the known model for the policy in favor of service disabled veteran owned businesses. Their model was mirrored in this provision and there's, that model was a very good one substantively. So it makes, this is a good balancing act about not overweighing one particular principle at the, at the uh, distraction of another principle. This process remains a competitive process. We're not just giving away something non-competitively as we do in nonprofit contracting, for instance. Uh, it's a competitive process with only a light thumb on the scale. It's a preference favoring a very limited circumstance and a very special part of commerce. I particularly appreciate that the definition and quantum of ownership must be certified by the SBA as it is with the veterans preference. It's rigorous, but objectively defined and determined. It's no secret that the qualifying ownership is gained and obscured through artifice and fraud. The instances of that are fill a book. So the opening for mischief and having a specified ownership requirement leaves a taint on the merit of the preference. And uh, there was a, uh, I think I mentioned the, a, a paper that was a distraction to the discussion. This is the problem with preferential bids for women and minorities. Uh, and he, there they say that the, um, all are, are the business, the biggest problem is, are the businesses actually owned by women or members of minority groups? Or are they just potent com companies that look one way on the outside, but another way from the inside? This kind of activity, which is probably a national problem, it is, it's legend, uh, according to uh, Philadelphia's Inspector General, Amy Cur Curlin, it represents the kind of loophole that's easy for businesses to climb through. You give them an easy entry, they will take it. It wouldn't seem tricky to figure out if a company meets the local definition of a woman or minority in business, but it turns out to be. So the SBA Women's Owned Small Business Federal Contracting Program website, SBA's uh, Women in Contracting website, lays out demands for SBA certification. And it is complicated. Uh, while it may not discern fraud, fraud up front, but in ownership particularly, it creates enough paper and breadcrumbs to uncover, it, uncover any fraud. And as we've seen with federal COVID relief, the feds follow that money trail. I do have one problem though with the bill that should be rectified. Uh, it's unnecessary um, and it's wrong. The bill states uh, uh, section three, page two, line seven to 10, that the procuring entity shall determine the best value of the entity in case of more than one woman owned business or woman owned business and service disabled veteran owned business are competing for the same contract. The situation here is, okay, there's a preference. If you've fallen into the guidelines of that preference, you, you are entitled to, to the benefit of that preference. But what if, one of your sisters owns another company and she also is entitled to it. What if your brother or your other sister is a service to disabled veteran and is entitled to it? This says, well, the entity gets to choose the one that is offers the best value to that entity. Um, that's not how the bill starts out. The bill starts out to award it to the lowest price price bid or offer. And it says, provided that there's no non-women bidder or offeror who has a bid that's more than 5% lower. 
So best value is not actually a metric that Guam Procurement Law uses. It's always lowest price, or in the case of professional services, best qualified, not best value to the to the vendor, to the buyer, I'm sorry, but the best qualified offeror based on all the qualifications that you have to uh, specify when you're going out for that kind of a, of a bid. So I, I would, I think that determination of best value opens up a hornet's nest of litigation, protests and everything. And, and it's not underpinned by a habit that we have here on Guam. I mean, historically we did have this when the procurement law was first written, public law 16.124, in, in Article Three, which lists uh, all of the methods that are allowed for source selection, that is procurement, it was listed in there along with uh, bidding, there to bidding, uh, uh, professional services procurements, emergency procurement, sole source procurement, small purchases procurement. Those are all in one place. There was at that time. Uh, a, a method called uh, competitive sealed bidding, sealed, sealed proposals, I'm sorry, competitive sealed proposals, not competitive sealed bidding. It was a proposal process. And that is in the nature of a negotiated contract. Feds call it a negotiated contract uh, because you can negotiate an awful lot of that. But somehow, somewhere, that section just disappeared from the government code. Uh, uh, I think what happened was they found out that best value is something like judging a beauty contest. It's in the eye of the beholder uh, and is open to an awful lot of misdirection uh, to try to put a fine word on it. Uh, so somehow or other that what had been would have been codified as section 52.112 became a different section altogether having to do with bid security and performance security bonds, which doesn't even belong in article three. Uh, and that was put in there by uh, public law 27-127. So we don't even find any more this best value method of source selection in the law. So it's, it's, it's wrong to use that as a metric uh, in that section that I quoted from. Under, uh, in, in, I'm using the word best value, which was not the way it was written, written in our law. In our law, it says that the award will go to the offeror with a proposal that is the most advantageous to the territory. It's sort of like best value, most advantageous, best value. Those are very fuzzy and they're subject to manipulation. Uh, and I think that that's why it got taken out. Uh, this best, most advantageous language that you see in some of the old codes, they have it in, in Saipan, for instance, uh, it uh, has been morphed and is now called best value. It's no longer called best, most advantageous. So the best value language there is a misnomer. It should, you should stick to the program that if you have competing people who all fit within the preference, it should go to the lowest price. And if it doesn't, I think that, that the bill has really got a uh, Achilles heel and I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't recommend the bill unless that were corrected. Is the scheme of this bill is that a woman-owned business is awarded the contract that it is the lowest price unless there's a non-woman non owned business whose price is more is five percent lower than the woman-owned business. So that same formula should apply. Whatever is the lowest amongst the group that is subject to gaining the award, uh, that that'll set the the uh, what do we call that the Anyway, 
can't think of the word now. Sorry, I'm uh, 72 and starting to lose some things along with my hair growing. Uh, uh, the, they, they have a competitive field. That's the, that's the phrase I was looking for. And the federal government systems talks about when you're looking at a negotiated contract, you create a competitive field of likely uh, prospective contractors, as we call them. Uh, and so when you have this comparative field of preference buyers, you should go to not the best value, but to the lowest price, because that fits the scheme that you started out with. Uh, and I, there's another one that I don't understand. And to that extent, it kind of bugs me that it's in there. There's an ex, uh, exception for this preference, women-owned businesses for professional services. I, I don't understand why they aren't beneficiaries of the preference as well. There may be good justification for it, but uh, I see excellent female doctors and lawyers and accountants and their contributions go far beyond a simple service contract. They become role models, whether they like that burden or not. Uh, these contracts have become newsworthy oftentimes and highlight the abilities and competence of professionals who can win the, win the work. They're an inspiration to us. I have four granddaughters, three born and still living on Guam. And I'd love them to be motivated by ha having examples like that. But what's going on with this bill that makes that distinction important? Why are we removing female professionals from this preference? If there's a good reason well, you know, I'd be the first to say, well, let's do that. But I haven't, I can't conceive of one and I haven't heard of one. Finally, uh, I want to be just a little bit pedantic uh, because I do a lot of drafting and pre procurement uh, and how they come together. They follow the model of the Disabled Veterans Bill, which is put out in two different sections. One section talks about the preference. And then the second section defines all the specifications to be entitled to the preference. That's what this bill tends to do as well. I, when you do that it, and you try to research a bill, you can get lost pretty quickly when you put the, the qualifications in the separate statute, even if they're back to back. Uh, and it is more often the case you'll find that a statute like that, that has uh, an objective and some details about it, you just put it in one section with subsections. So uh, 5013 would become 5013A and 1513B, uh, and you'd have all of it wrapped up in there. That's, that's just me uh, being picky about the way I, I, I uh, get caught when I'm trying to research and I didn't realize that there was more to it in another section. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm available for big facts and questions. Uh, thank you so much, Attorney Brown, for that um, very uh, cl clear uh, explanation and uh, the guy as well. Um, and, and for your time for being here. So uh, I do have some questions regarding uh, preference points. Do you think that would be um, a better process uh, or similar to this, what this bill proposes? Uh, if we're talking about procurement, again, this, this is wealth distribution within the con context of procurement. What is procurement? Procurement is spending the government money. So this, as it is, says, okay, lowest price wins, because we want to save the government money. I would stick to that. Okay. Uh, and then in the part of the bill that talks about, should there be competing, um, you know, for instance, there are several women owned businesses vying for the same um, bid. Um, how would you, I guess, resolve that issue? What, what would you recommend okay. to 
that, that's what I was discussing and obviously uh, confusing uh, people. When I was talking about the language that says determine the best value to the entity, uh, the procuring entity shall determine the best value to the entity in case of multiple qualified people competing for the same contract. And, and I would suggest we take out determine the best value and just uh, use the same language uh, that we start with. It's a price and then determine uh, the, the entity shall choose the lowest uh, price bid. That's what we do with most of our procurement. Comparative bidding, the bidding is, is our standard uh, an official fallback, and it's based on lowest price. Thank you for that clarification. So the other question is, uh, we did reach out to Gita and asked if they have a certification for women-owned businesses, and they don't currently have one at this time. So I guess um, it, perhaps uh, a question, this is a follow-up question maybe for, um, I guess this could be a follow-up uh, discussion as we move move this bill, or as we um, you know further amend this bill, to see uh, what what are the ideas that Gita would have, um, because you know from what I hear from the testimony today, it's a pretty drawn out process. Uh, maybe this this could be a question for um, uh, Director Flores, uh, or um, I think it was uh, Ms. Logie that had had recommended it in her testimony. But uh, do you have recommendations as far as um, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, certification for women-owned businesses? What do you see as some of the, the key elements? Um, and first of all, how, how is the federal process, uh, I guess, more cumbersome in, in getting these certifications? Well, the, the certification uh, through SBA has uh, extra benefits because once you're cert certified as a woman-owned business, this bill. You're also certified for anything that comes up in the federal government available to a woman-owned business. You're, you're far ahead of the game. So I, I think you'd have to find a, a, a pretty good uh, second to that. The other thing is you're relying on, on a neutral umpire to make that determination. It's the SBA. It's not people who know people. And so you're going to get a less influenced ultimate decision-making process. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy with it. It's worked for the veterans evidently because they haven't changed that law since it was written. It's exactly the same uh, proposition that you have in the veterans own law, own business law. So uh, again, for me, I would take some convincing to go to, to uh, jump on another horse, I don't know anything about. All right, thank you, Attorney Brown. Uh, so I guess this question for Miss um, Logie, if you can um, provide some input. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if uh, Jane also has any more input on this, but I think uh, we would have to look into that further and then also speak with Gita on that. Um, I think there would be certain requirements in place for the certification. And if I understand correctly, um, there is a federal, federal certification for women owned businesses. And we would likely look into something like that to kind of mirror for local requirements as well. Um, and that's the best I can say on that at this moment, um, but certainly something we can follow up and look more into if we do proceed with the bill getting passed. Thank you, Ms. Logie. Director um, Flores. Sure. I, I was also involved with the women's chamber um, with drafting the bill and, you know, mirroring the, the um, disabled veteran owns let, owned legis legislation. But we were we were just thinking if if a local business only wanted to do business with the government of Guam and did not want to venture into the federal contracting game. Because that, you know, and, and Attorney Brown is right, it is, it is a very prestigious distinction, but it also requires a DUNS number and, and to jump through hoops that a local, if, if there is a local woman owned business that just wants to get a government contract and, you know, do business with the government of Guam and not with the federal government to make them jump through that hoop while it is um, um, uh, 
like an objective horse to jump over, as he said, um, it might be a little bit more uh, daunting for, for just a local business. But, and I did speak with um, director um, Mel Mendiola and she, her team at Guido was willing to, because they do um, local business programs was willing to um, be able to do the certification. But um, if, you know, if the legislature wants it to be just only the SBA certification, uh, that is not something that is that we would object to. I don't. I don't think. Okay. Thank we were just thinking that there are, you know, if local owned businesses that don't want to venture into the federal realm and they just want to stay on island and do business on island, to make them jump through that SBA hoop is um, is rather cumbersome. But uh, it is. It is a good. It is. A, good designation to have, so. All right, thank you for that response. Um, so another question I have, so the fiscal note uh, was, uh, it received a waiver uh, for this bill. Uh, BBMR states that the bill is an administrative in nature and poses no fiscal impact upon any funds of the government of Guam. And so I just wanted to get some input uh, from the panel to see if um, that you see, um, if you concur with that determination. Um, Attorney Brown, if you, have any uh, comments regarding the um, fiscal note waiver? I, I don't, but can I just step back one more to, to the point that Jane was making uh, uh, and I too, to some extent. Before you decide to leave that horse, I talked to Ken over at the SBA. Look, I can't remember Ken's last name at the moment. And uh, Luhan. Yeah. Luhan, hey, thank you. I went yeah. Since the 80s, but I forget everything I knew in the 80s. Uh, so uh, he may have some ideas on how uh, that could be modified or implemented in another way or keep the uh, objectivity of their, their process uh, so that when you're coming up with our own process, so we can have something to judge it against before we make the final choice. But Ken, Ken would be a big help, I'm sure. Thank you for that. Um, Senator uh, Perez, without, with, with regard to the fiscal note um, and no cost to the government of Guam, I, I would think that, the, that something like this would help the government of Guam because you are um, you know, giving women-owned businesses a, a chance to flourish. And, and you know, when they flourish, they pay more taxes, that kind of thing. So you can employ more people. So it is a, it's kind of a domino, a positive domino effect. All right, thank you, uh, Director Flores. Um, Ms. Logie, if you wanna to respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nothing else to add. I, I, it shouldn't affect the, uh, the general fund or any GovGuam funds uh, directly as it's a bidding process. So I don't see any conflict with that. And Attorney Brown, do you have any comments? Yes. Yeah, uh, it, two different things happen here. We talked about it, it doesn't have any economic impact uh, and that, that I agree, but then we said it doesn't have any direct impact. And I disagree at that point. If it does have a direct impact, it has an economic impact on government purposes that may require this because you're getting uh, 5% cheaper, uh, more, You're, the government is paying five, up to 5% more for the same stuff it could have got from somebody else. That's the effect of this. So that, that is a cost increase to the government. Uh, and uh, so to the extent that that overrides a broader view of things, and I don't know anything about how the government decides when those statements are necessary when they're not, but uh, the, you got, Two different uh, sets of glasses you need to look through. Okay. Another, yeah. Another point is that um, while while Attorney Brown does have a point, the designation would not come for free. I mean, if if whether it's Revin Tax or Gita or you know SBA, the government could charge you know businesses for a women-owned designation. There could be a fee with that you would have to like you know with your abc license or your um your business license it could be a fee that you know to be to have a special designation and um uh 
I believe Director Mendiola said said as much. He said we would probably put together a, a scale, you know, where you this would cost a little bit more to have a woman-owned business de designation. Uh, well, thank you for that input. So I would like to um, open the floor to my colleagues, uh, Senator Brown, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. I really, I really don't have any questions, but I certainly uh, appreciate uh, this particular bill. I think at the end of the day, what we're wanting to do and what we'd like to see is leveling the playing field and certainly encouraging more women in our community uh, to come forth, particularly in the private sector, um, to get involved in, in businesses and projects here that I think will expand um, and level the playing field. I think we want to see more of that. We've definitely seen that in the legislature the last couple of terms um, where traditionally, you know, we had, uh, not that we have anything against men. They're very wonderful, wonderful people to have also with us. But, uh, you know, back in the day, there was only maybe one or two or three women in the legislature. And now you see we are pretty much dominating in the last couple of terms, the membership in the legislature. Uh, and it's also encouraging women out there that it's possible to reach these heights. And we're seeing many examples in our community of women that are very active in the business community. And we'd like this to become a standard for everyone, for both men and women in our community. So thank you very much. I was very pleased to be able to co-sponsor this bill. And I certainly look forward to the future debate and hopefully the passage of it into law. So thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman, for the opportunity to comment on this bill. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, Senator Shelton, do you have any questions for the panel? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I don't have any questions right now. I do appreciate all of the discussion and the recommendations from uh, the panel and everyone who's helped to draft this legislation and uh, help us strengthen it to move it forward. I, I thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you, Senator Shelton. Senator Mary Torres. Thank you. I just want to also echo the um, appreciation to the panel and the very thoughtful and thorough uh, discussion about this bill. Um, what what I, I think I keep going back to is how this now mirrors what's in federal statute already. So it, it I, I can see, um, Mr. Brown, your your point of view, but um, but I, I think also the 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 gain from this and, and how this will help us get to an objective of leveling the playing field and in, encouraging more women to go into business um, is, is an avenue through this piece of legislation. So certainly we'll look at all points and, and I just thank you again for the very thorough discussion. Um, certainly a lot of food for thought. Uh, thank you, Senator Torres. Senator Moylan, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the panel. I uh, appreciate all the information. Very, very hopeful. Um, Attorney Kono is, is not here, but I, I think um, they're in support of this bill uh, from what I saw on the on their report coming from GSA. Um, maybe Mr. Brown, just on, on your opinion, uh, with, with, the, with this bill, do you see any need for GSA to have um, uh, manpower, additional manpower for this purpose, or they should be sufficient uh, in fulfilling if this bill does become law, uh, that they can um, easily keep it uh, going if they don't have additional manpower. It, out of you, just for your opinion, sir. Thank you. So this requires uh, an extra investigation by the agency doing the procuring, because they will have to affirm that this bidder or offeror is uh, a qualified woman owned business, 51% ownership. And does that include, um, by the way, uh, community property interests? Uh, you know, what do we mean by owned? So I'd rather go to something that the feds have already worked out. Uh, and uh, but as long as you know we have a workable definition that is uh, pretty foolproof, uh, and it's uh, when you put it in action, that uh, there's still going to have to be. I mean, if Gita has a certifi certification that they want to issue, and they can just pop up and show that, then that's fine, and there's no extra burden on on GSA. 
But otherwise, somebody at GSA or other agencies are going to have to make that determination and ask for all the information that you need to have in order to learn whether they are actually 51% owned or 51% owned uh, and, and that sort of thing. But to some extent, that is done in other provisions as well. I mean, we have a, a ownership disclosure law uh, in uh, 5233 uh, that talks about uh, does anybody have more than 10% ownership in this building? So. It, 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 it does happen, but uh, that was rarely uh, an issue. You know, it sets a low bar, 10% ownership. That's not much of a problem. Um, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Um, so yes, I think it's important that we get the details. So the last thing we want to do is, uh, you know, have any protests, right? We, you know, the intentions are good. We just want to, want to make, make sure the process is very clear. And um, yeah. Yeah, the protests could come from another woman-owned business, you know. Right. Yeah, that's in that pool of competing for that bid. And then competition gets really skewed in, in the procurement law. Great. Well, thank, thank you for um, the panel for their, their responses and their, their participation. Um, so at this time, I would like to offer the closing to the sponsor of this bill, Senator Amanda Shelton. Sure. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And again, uh, thank you for hearing the bill today and to our partners at the Guam uh, Women's Chamber of Commerce for your uh, support and your assistance in drafting this legislation and moving it forward. And thank you to you, Attorney Brown, for your uh, testimony today and your suggestions as well. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we're we heard really positive testimony about how much uh, this is needed for our economic recovery and to uh, give women a, a helping hand in, in uh, the private sector. And uh, I appreciate uh, the advocacy here today and I, I won't belabor it. I know that you know we heard for over the last hour about this bill. So just uh, my appreciation to everyone and I, I hope this will move forward uh, expeditiously. Sidious so Masi. Uh, thank you, Senator Shelton, and thank you to all those in the panel that have come here to testify. Uh, bill number 71-36-COR is now duly heard. Um, so we're going to move on to the next item. It's bill number 65-36-COR, uh, sponsored by Senator Amanda Shelton, co-sponsored by Senators Mary Camacho-Torres, Vice Speaker Ro Tina Rose Mooney barnes uh, Senator Jose Pito Terlahi, and myself. It's an act to amend subsections A4, C1, D2 and D4, all of sections 7120.1, chapter seven, title 16, Guam code annotated, relative to removing the date of expiration of removable windshield placards and extending the period of time for physician certification on temporary removable windshield placards. So I'd like to um, allow the sponsor of this bill, uh, Legislative Secretary Amanda Shelton for the introduction. Half a day again, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for hearing bill number 65-36-COR today and for this opportunity to speak on the bill. Our residents on island with permanent disabilities should not have to trek to the Department of Revenue and Taxation and wait in line to renew their accessibility placards. Bill number 65 will remove the expiration date entirely on placards for those with permanent disabilities. So for uh, those who are listening and maybe uh, in our community who are familiar, the permanent placards are the placards uh, that are blue that we see in the windshields of uh, uh, in the cars and uh, the temporary placards that we're speaking about are the red placards. So the bill also extends the upper limit of the placards validity of temporary disabilities from six months to 12 months. And the bill retains that disability of any kind must be certified by a physician. Individuals with disabilities may have a physical or mental impairment that restricts their activities of daily living requiring biannual doctor's visits and subjecting these individuals to long lines and copious amounts of paperwork is unnecessary. Because of the pandemic, government agencies must abide by limited occupancy and capacity rules created to keep our community safe. And the bill seeks not only to support a vulnerable population, but to ease DRT's increasing workload and alleviate staff that is spread thin already. 
providing physical accommodations for those with limitations is insufficient if we do not advocate for an accessible and reasonable application process from start to finish. This bill breaks down barriers for individuals with disabilities in our community and brings relief to this very stressful process. So I want to thank you again, Madam Chair, for your co-sponsorship and for hearing this bill today and to our colleagues who've also uh, signed on to support uh, to support this effort. And just a little bit of background for our colleagues. Um, uh, over the course of the pandemic, I received a, a few calls from disabled individuals in our community who have these uh, placard cards in their uh, in their cars and they use it. And they were very worried about having to go to the Department and Revenue Tax, maybe make an appointment, wait in a long line uh, to get um, to get it renewed because of an expiration day. Uh, when they know that they've been confirmed to have a disability that they will have for life and uh, uh, worried about having to go to the doctors first to get the physician's uh, recertification and then go back to Revin Tax to go through this process. And it was, uh, it seemed uh, very uh, easy for us to uh, come to the Guam code and, and fix this, just a common sense measure to break down this barrier and uh, make the process easier for our community. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Legislative Secretary Shelton. Um, so we did reach out to DRT. They have submitted written testimony, I believe. Um, we don't just don't, I don't have the copy in front of me right now. Um, it also received a fiscal note waiver uh, it's uh, per BBMR. The bill is administrative in nature and poses no fiscal impact upon any of the funds of government of Guam. Uh, at this time, we don't have anybody here to present testi oral testimony, uh, but I would like to give um, perhaps my colleagues opportunities to ask any questions. Um, Senator Shelton, well, you, you did the opening. <laughs> uh, Senator Tello, Taitigui, any questions? Okay, any questions from my colleagues? Yes. Not really. Uh, some <laughs> questions. Uh, um, just uh, you know, I appreciate this legislation. You know, my father, who who has a placard as well, um, and uh, you know, he's ninety two years old. So this makes it a whole lot easier for him to, you know, not have to go down to Revin Tax, um, which is very taxing, and it, actually, it's almost impossible nowadays. You know, with the line and they're playing catch up. So. Um, the only thing is, is to find some kind of, I think we need to find some kind of assistance for those who um, have a disability uh, and, and help them even more so. I was hoping that the um, director of Revin Tax would be here because um, I'm getting calls myself in my office where they're, they're trying to make an appointment to go in to renew uh, certain, uh, you know, even their business license um, uh, as well as, you know, driver's license and some of them still drive, even my dad but um, which we don't make him drive by the way. <laughs> okay, just, anyways, uh, yeah, we really was hoping that the uh, director would be here so to answer some questions on how to assist those armanumku and those especially with disabilities, you know, and, and getting anything renewed at this point. But I, I stand in full support of this legislation. I've seen my father having to, to get it renewed um, year after end, but uh, appreciate the legislation from the author. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Tidegui. Senator uh, Mary Torres, do you have any comments? Or no, questions? no questions. Uh, I just want to thank the the main sponsor for inviting me to co-sponsor. I think that once, whenever we can eliminate barriers for our Manamco, it's, it's always a good thing to do. So thank you for including me in this legislation as a sponsor. Thank you, Senator Torres. Senator Brown, do you have any comments? Very much, Matt, Madam Chair. No, I really don't, but I think it's I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, anything we can do to still facilitate making sure that those that uh, definitely need the designation for persons with disabilities um, to be able to go where they need to go and, and be able to park where they need to park is, is a very good thing. So I'm certainly very supportive uh, of the legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Moylan, do you have any comments? No, thank you. Thank you, Senator Moylan. Um, yeah, so thank you to, uh, to the Legislative Secretary for allowing me to be a co-sponsor as well. Yeah, I, I know how difficult it is uh, for, um, you know, 
the public to uh, to be basically uh, access the resources of DRT and uh, especially those with disabilities. I think that that is uh, makes it even more difficult. So anything that we can do to reduce the barriers to gaining access, equal access, I am full support. So uh, at this time, I would like to allow uh, legislative secretary for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I know there was some discussion with DRT when we were getting ready to introduce the bill uh, that there um, may be a problem if uh, the placard was deteriorating even without an expiration date. We wanna make sure that uh, whoever is monitoring uh, the disabled parking slots that they're able to, uh, you know, still see it. It's not breaking into pieces and there may be a need down the line for them to be replaced or uh, maybe uh, laminated or kept in some kind of plastic pr protective e uh, equipment so that uh, they last an even longer time than the three years that they're meant to last right now. So uh, those are things that uh, maybe we can continue discussing with DRT or it's addressed in their testimony. I'm not sure. We haven't seen it yet, but I do appreciate that they've uh, been able to discuss this with us and help us move it forward. And to all of our colleagues here today, uh, thank you very much for your support and uh, helping us to uh, continue supporting individuals in our community who need a little extra assistance through this measure. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Legislative Secretary uh, Shelton. So being that there are no more testimonies or comments at this time, um, bill number 65-36 COR is now duly heard. Uh, we're moving on to the next item on the agenda. It's bill 69-36 COR. Uh, it was sponsored by the Committee on Air Transportation, Parks, Tourism, Higher Education, and Advancement of Women, Youth, and Senior Citizens by the request of the Guam Youth Congress in accordance with 2 GCA Section 7102. It's an act to add a new chapter 54C to Division 2 of Title 10 Guam Code Annotated relative to prohibiting the sale of polystyrene foam containers and serving a prepared food using polystyrene foam containers. I'd like to invite the sponsor of this bill for introduction, um, Senator Amanda Shelton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to thank, of course, our Guam Youth Congress uh, for this bill that we introduced on their behalf. Uh, for the benefit of everyone, the committee uh, and the public here today, uh, bill number 69-36 COR was introduced by the Committee on Air Transportation, Parks, Tourism, Higher Education and the Advancement of Women, Youth and Senior Citizens on behalf of the Guam Youth Congress in accordance with section 7102 of chapter seven, title two Guam code annotated. All bills passed by the Guam Youth Congress will be introduced by this committee on their behalf. The 33rd Guam Youth Congress held a regular session on February 20th, 2021, where they passed bill number 7-33 COR introduced by its prime sponsor, Representative Kiana Yabat. The committee received the certification of passage on bill number 7-33 on February 24th, 2021, and subsequently introduced it on as bill number 69-36 COR in the 36th Guam legislature. Uh, Madam Chair, I thank you very much for hearing this bill expeditiously. Uh, I know that our uh, Guam Youth Congress is very excited to see uh, the bills that they are passing in their body moving forward here in the legislature. Uh, and I um, thank them of course for being a very active body uh, pursuing these measures and pushing us to pursue them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Shelton. Um, so now I'd like to uh, invite at this time uh, from the Youth Congress, Kiana Yabut, to provide uh, testimony regarding uh, bill number 69-36 COR. Thank you, uh, Senator Perez. Um, excuse me, buenas everyone. Uh, yes, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Senator Perez. Thank you so much for having this public hearing and for hearing Bill 69. My name is Representative Kiana Yabut. I'm from the Guam, the 33rd Guam Youth Congress. And uh, like Senator Shelton mentioned, I was also the primary sponsor of the bill when it was introduced in GYC. Uh, Kyle Dehelig is also here. He was another one of my co-sponsors. Unfortunately, Vice Speaker LeBang couldn't make it today. But while I was doing research for this bill, I found a University of Guam study that found that 58% of people here indicated that they were willing to purchase sustainable options rather than styrofoam if they were given the option. And 
when I saw that, that was when I knew that this styrofoam ban was something that was very possible for our island. There's, there's no doubt that our island, we consume a high amount of styrofoam, everything from fiestas to rosaries, they're common products that you see at these events, right? And eventually these styrofoam products, they end up in the landfill and they take years upon years to disintegrate. I thought a lot about that and how years and years from now, I myself will no longer be a member of the youth. I'll be an adult and eventually a senior citizen. And I thought about how I didn't want more of the island to be used as landfill space. And I thought about how there are so many other great things that the government could spend millions of dollars on other than a landfill. I thought about how styrofoam has detrimental effects on people's health. And I thought about how there really is no upside to styrofoam other than cost and convenience. And it, it saddened me, right? It saddened me to know that our counterparts in the FSM have already imposed this ban and you know we have yet to do so. And it saddens me to know that if this high usage of styrofoam continues that the possibility of opening another landfill is very likely. The people of Guam deserve a clean and sustainable future. And it is time for us to start looking beyond cost and convenience. And it's, it's going to be a big change, there is no doubt. However, I think that having the enactment date of the ban take place in 2023 gives our community a substantial amount of time to prepare themselves and, and adjust for the coming change, just like uh, how we're adjusting now with the enacted plastic bag ban. And I just think we have to remember that we, we can't make any progress without big changes. And that's the mindset that we need to have when it comes to issues like this. So I thank you again, uh, Senator Perez, for coming, uh, holding this public hearing. Uh, I come in full support of this bill, and I hope to see its passage on the session floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kiana, uh, for your, your testimony. Um, we appreciate all your efforts and your consciousness that you're raising within uh, our community, both your peers and um, uh, the elders. So at this time, I would like to recognize Ba Shil uh, to testify on behalf of Bill 69-36 COR. Oh, thank you. Uh, in, and on the island of Guam, um, Guam si Boss, I'm the I'm the lead for the Guam Youth Climate Strike, and I'm also involved in other environmental roles such as Guam Green Growth, such as the Guam Green Growth Initiative. With lines of products on every corner dangled in front of our eyes and placed into our hands, becoming almost a social a societal no, a norm, simply for the sake of convenience. Mm -hmm. It is easy to place the burden, blame, and responsibility of the consumer going about. Sorry, uh, did you say something? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the connection's kind of a, a unstable. Um, perhaps if you can start uh, from the beginning. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, it's just a little shaky sometimes. Um, so, Guahu Si Baz, I'm the lead for Guam Youth Climate Strike, and I'm involved in other environmental roles, such as the Guam Green Growth Initiative. With lines of products on every corner dangled in, in front of our eyes and placed into our hands, becoming almost a societal norm simply for the sake of convenience. It is easy to place the burden, blame, and responsibility on the busy consumer going about their day and not pondering on every aspect of life, shifting the spotlight from the actual problem as we see in many other polluting industries of our time, dodging all accountability. Without efforts spearheaded by the government to inform and educate the, the public on, on the conse consequences we contribute to by allowing the use of styrofoam, the public's responsibility and need to inspect everything, deny and consider every service or product that comes in front before our eyes should simply not stand. Although, although sustainability is everyone's responsibility, it would help the consumer if the gov government can aid businesses in eliminating the threat of styrofoam once and for all. By striking at the very root of the issue, in this case, the continued use of uh, polystyrene packaging in Guam's stores, we significantly cut the time and money spent on dealing with mounting polystyrene, adverting a whole step of the process 
uh, of the waste management process, effectively easing the strain on the environment and our landfills. Not only does this reduce a seemingly logistical problem, as growing stockpiles of pollution spill in, into our landfills, the discontinued use of polystyrene in Guam also delivers a striking blow to the fossil fuel companies producing them and contributing to the whole to a whole host of other issues. For these reasons, I support the bill's aim to phase out the, the circulation of polystyrene in Guam's economy and environment by January 1st, 2023. At a time when we are shifting away from harmful solid pollutants, the oppor opportunities to close the, the rifts uh, between consumer and provider by knitting a closer relationship between the two instead of handing off the issue to the public is, uh, is, is really important. On the bright side, with, the moment, with this momentum, we could shift to a circular economy where waste is naturally lowered and any waste created is picked up and properly disposed of by the company uh, in, uh, with the help of the consumer. I want to thank you so much for, for moving us closer toward a greener, uh, uh, greener future. Thank you, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Boss, for your presence and uh, your testimony. We appreciate that. Uh, so now at this time, I'd like to recognize um, Kyle Dehile uh, to provide his uh, testimony. Buenas and half a day, members of the committee and Guam. Ina Anhusi Kyle Dehile. I am the president of the University of Guam Green Army and member of the Us for Guam Network. I want to credit the skeleton of the bill and original writer, former Senator Fernando Estevez. It was introduced in the Guam Youth Congress last term and has made its way here today. We know that from the plastic bag ban, there was a missing component and that was outreach to the community, businesses and suppliers. Upon en enactment, thankfully the community, media outlets and businesses worked together to educate and promote the ban. With modifications, even I trust that Congresso in Manhoban Guahan added a requirement for educational outreach through Representative Alexander Gale, six months in advance, and so on. I believe that we need to acknowledge that when we find a replacement for the polystyrene packaging, it does not solve the overall problem of overconsumption of single use materials. Just because something is compostable or biodegradable doesn't mean it will go through the right process to biodegrade. And this bill is integral to sustainability. And I need us to continue to work towards solutions and create a system where we can truly shift from single use to zero waste. And we can do this pretty hem blue through making a composting, a, a composting system a standard on Guam and part of the waste management system. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Dehelik. Uh, so we do have Guam EPA present. If I can ask them to uh, turn on their video so we can see uh, them. And uh, they wanna provide testimony. I, I believe uh, Glenn St. Nicholas from Guam EPA is here to testify. Oh, shoot. Can everybody hear me? Okay, my video is not working, so um, I'm just going to, can I just read the testimony? Uh, yes. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's all right. <clears throat> Half a day, Senator Perez and Senators of, in the committee <clears throat> for uh, Bill 6936, Prohibition of Polystyrene Containers. Uh, my name is Glenn Nicholas. I'm the Solid Waste Program Manager for Guam EPA. And on behalf of Walter S. Leon Grell, the Administrator of Guam EPA, Guam EPA is pleased to support Bill 6936. <clears throat> the overall level of waste production is correlated with an increase in the population and implies an increase in the amount of overall waste. While there are unofficial <clears throat> and official waste disposal sites that people may use to get rid of their waste, there is a small but still significant amount of people who dump their waste illegally in the jungle and other secluded places. Polystyrene is extremely difficult to dispose of properly. 
Studies have shown that the production, use, and disposal of polystyrene causes adverse environmental and health effects. These impacts are of considerable concern, as according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, styrofoam is the fifth largest source of hazardous waste in the United States. Polystyrene, or styrofoam, is a non-biodegradable substance used for insulation, most commonly found in keeping our beverages hot or cold and storing our leftovers. However, it is harmful and its effects outweigh <laughs> cheap and convenient use drawing significant cause for a ban on its use. Polystyrene is not usually recycled due to its lightweight nature and the high economic costs of transporting and degreasing the petroleum-based material. Polystyrene t takes at least 500 years to decompose and poses a widespread threat to the health of wild animals and the ecosystems that depend on them. When thrown away as trash, polystyrene cannot biodegrade or break down via other means, remaining in the environment for hundreds of years. Keep in mind, plastics cover 25 to 30 percent of space in landfills. Styrofoam is primary source of urban litter and is a main pollutant of oceans and other water sources. Every year, volunteers collect tons of trash along Guam's coastlines, roads, and illegal dump sites. Among the trash collected, styrofoam is prevalent. Guam is paying for the construction of Luzon Landfill Cell 3 at the cost of $30 million. We must reduce, reuse, and recycle and control the type of waste that enters into the landfill to protect our limited resources and our environment. With the passage of Bill 6936, Guam will be able to extend the life of its only landfill. We ask that you and your colleagues also consider that this unfunded mandate will create a need for additional resources to inspect and enforce this additional statute under the Solid Waste Management Program. Therefore, Guam EPA is requesting for the funding of two additional staffs, full-time employees, to enforce this mandate. This funding and staff will include an outreach campaign. We are also requesting that the proposed enforcement fee structure, which uses the revolving recycling fund, be changed to the Guam EPA Solid Waste Management Fund to implement the mandates outlined in Bill 6936 to conduct public outreach inspections and enforcement action. Thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you all today. We look forward to a favorable consideration, respectively. Walter S. Leon Garrell. Thank you so much, Len, for, for your presence and uh, for your patience. You were on, uh, I think, at the beginning of this public hearing. Uh, and I'd like to open the floor to Jane Flores, Director Flores, for her testimony. Thank you, Senator. I promise we'll be brief. Um, I am switching hats now and putting on my hat as a GWCC board member. The GWCC fully supports this ban on this bill 6936, um, which uh, provides for a ban on polystyrene or styrofoam containers due to the fact that they are not biodegradable and are harmful to our island environment and our ecosystem, as you have heard in a previous testimony. We do have two suggestions for senators to consider with regard to the legislation, though. Um, from a business perspective, uh, we, we would um, recommend that the date of enactment should be two years from the first day of the month that the bill is signed into law because that gives a year for um, um, education and uh, the public education campaign about the impending ban, and then to give vendors and food establishments that use the containers a sufficient amount of time to exhaust their inventory and research, purchase, and provide customers with a more eco-friendly alternative. They may have, um, because of the pandemic, they have may have bought an abundance of styrofoam containers because of the um, the upshoot in um, delivery and in takeout um, services due to the pandemic. So there is that to consider. Also, we recommend that the civil penalty amount for a third or any subsequent violation of the styrofoam container ban be lowered not to exceed $5,000.
we think $10,000 is a little excessive in nature. And once this ban is in effect, we don't think that there will be a problem with businesses if you give them the two-year time frame, because there will be a lot of public support for this, we think, you know, with the environment. And um, we don't think that you'll have too many businesses that will violate it if you give them enough time to exhaust their inventory and you give enough time for the education campaign. And finally, we're very encouraged that the Guam Youth Congress has introduced this bill. It shows that the Guam's young people are concerned with promoting environmental awareness and preserving our beautiful island environment, and we're very proud of them. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Wells. So um, I would like to just read the fiscal note. So Per BBMR, the proposed legislation may impose <clears throat> a fiscal impact to Guam EPA and Guam Salt Waste Authority. Impacts may include personnel costs to ensure enforcement. Revenues may be collected from fines, but are highly unlikely given to the lead time. Absent any pertinent information from the affected agencies, the Bureau is unable to determine an approximate fiscal impact. However, the fiscal note does not address the potential increase in cost of government contracts related to food service. Um, I'm sorry, that wasn't part of the EMS. Uh, that was just notes. So that, that's some of the um, additional information. So um, I do have some questions uh, for Mr. Uh, Kinkless from Guam EPA. So I remember there was a, a discussion perhaps as uh, what about the ban banning importation versus uh, this route? I, I know you read the statement from Guam EPA, but which one would be easier to uh, perhaps enforce? Uh, importation ban or this particular route? Is this addressed to Guam EPA? Yes, yes, it's oh, to you. Okay, sorry, it, it's, uh, I, I think that um, enforcing the ban via importation would be the best way to enforce this particular uh, bill since there are over 5,000 uh, establishments out there and we have uh, in my program three full-time employees uh, to include myself and uh, that's what we're finding right now with the plastic bag ban as well the, the plastic bag ban um, has uh, you know about maybe three three thousand establishments that we need to uh, inspect so we're counting on uh, call-ins and complaints, so which I suspect will also uh, require the same with the styrofoam ban. Uh, but yes, I agree, it, it should uh, be controlled uh, on the imports uh, via a notice of arrival for any type of um, packaging material that would be used for, for food. Uh, whether it be running it through Guam EPA uh, via notice of arrival and uh, along with the specifications and uh, us determining whether or not it's it's a, uh, authorized. You know, one of the things that one of the things that I did not mention uh, during the testimony is, you know, since it's still early on uh, to ban polystyrene, um, I think maybe it's also a good time to include uh, uh, plates and cups into that category because what will end up happening is businesses will most likely comply with the, uh, the packaging requirements, but they'll replace it with polystyrene plates and film. Uh, so it, it's still, you know, that, that product would still be out in the market for its use. Uh, just something to think about. I'm trying to look and see because I think that was included, but I could I could double check. Uh, I thought that the cups and the plates were part of any um, distribution of food or beverage. So that probably is covered under them. We can double check that. Um, so, um, how, how quickly can something like this be implemented if there was a an importation ban? And what would be the proper, I guess, rollout or phase out of it? You know, I'm I'm thinking that um, we advertise once the pat once the bill is a uh, is 
has passed um, and have a phase out period um, to allow the establishments to exhaust their current inventory and um, do aggressive outreach and education for you know for the for the public because the, the public also needs to be aware of of these products because we're going to rely heavily on 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 complaints for enforcement so there'll be our eyes and ears out there and uh, you know be mindful that establishments would also include a lot of these you know food trucks and and food vendors um, and they're all over the place um, that we need to have visibility on so I, I think maybe you know uh, aggressive advertisement uh, once the bill is signed uh, and then giving uh, the regulated community time to comply by uh, you know uh, coming up with a timeline and allowing them to exhaust their current inventory uh, but you can always you can always control it in the imports again if you if you say okay by this time we're gonna uh, we're going to prohibit the importation of this then we can control it at our borders from coming in. Because otherwise, if we don't control it in on the imports, it'll still come in and it'll still be out there. So just, uh, and that's what we're finding as well with some of the plastic bags, is that even though there's a ban, uh, people are still you know, importing it and it could make its way back out into the market. Oh, thanks, Glenn. Um, Right. So uh, I'd like to open up questions uh, to my colleagues, um, Senator Amanda Johnson. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the Guam Youth Congress and the uh, Guam EPA for being here today to uh, discuss this bill. Uh, I'm, you know, happy that the Guam Youth Congress has uh, passed this legislation, is forwarded to us, and I'm uh, thankful for the discussion. I know. Um, that uh, Representative DeHelig has shared with us uh, that uh, Bill 69 does include language to ban uh, import uh, it, that is included in the bill as well. And so uh, I, we will be reviewing that, uh, I hope that in the committee level or on the floor, if we, we get to that point. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Shelton. Yeah, I was looking through the bill. Um, it was focused on yeah, I'll double check that as well to ensure. All right, so Senator Tidegui, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chair, for the opportunity. And I, I'd like to thank Kiana. It was a great testimony that she provided uh, and the information that you brought up. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope to see you in the future too on uh, other legislation. And you know, I want to thank you too, because this, this bill was introduced in the 34th Guam Legislature, uh, Bill 379. Unfortunately, it was uh, introduced in November of 2018. So of course, it was the ending of the term of uh, good Senator Estevez, um, definitely a pioneer, uh, one who was not afraid to tackle this type of um, legislation that is as controversial as the bag bill was controversial. But I think, you know, we're in a day and age now that we, we see the importance of uh, taking care of our environment and uh, that the youth is seeing that this is the next generation. We wanna be able to have a safe and clean environment when we grow up and our children grow up too as well. So I wanna thank you for, for this legislation and, and uh, I great, greatly appreciate it. Um, I too had some concerns on, I was, actually talking about the wholesale you know, distributors, uh, not just those that are bringing in, but uh, um, you, you talk about stores or restaurants, but uh, we can also um, probably be a lot easier to tackle to um, uh, for EPA's purposes on uh, looking at wholesalers, you know, that distribute these, these um, products that are made with the polystyrofoam. So, um, I'm looking forward to ensuring this bill covers all angles. Um, I think that if we can get this bill passed uh, within this year or even in the next three, four months, uh, we will met the deadline of a two year uh, window 
to provide this uh, moving forward. I, I kind of did the math and, to, and it's, it's about two years. And um, I think I'd like to continue to keep this, this deadline there so that uh, it encourages us to move forward and move on this bill to make this bill happen. We also need to, uh, I'd like to, was hoping to find more people in the business sector, the public sector that uses these um, and let, let us know what you know they feel about it. But I'm seeing in the business community, especially in the, uh, in the restaurant business, we're finding a lot of them are already you know, eliminating this type right now. I mean, they're using uh, paper um, or recyclable um, options currently. And, um, and that's a good sign. So hopefully, uh, Kiana, we're not going to have too much of a, you know, hold back from, from this or, you know, any uh, people not wanting to have this happen soon, very soon. It needs to be done. It needs to be done. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. And thank you, Kiana, for your hard work on this. Yeah. And that's that. Uh, thank you, Senator Tidegui. Uh, so we have about 15 to 20 minutes before they reset. So just keep that in mind. Um, Senator um, Joanne Brown, if you have any questions, comments. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I did. I wanted, I just, I, I, overall, I, I'm, I'm very supportive of the concept. I think we recognize, gosh, we've gone through such an age of disposability in our society. I mean, from, you know, the, the cups and other containers and, and uh, the styrofoam, which are very familiar, especially during this past year of the pandemic, when we probably ordered more takeout than we ever have in our lives for, you know, restaurants that have had these services available during the pandemic. Um, so I'm very supportive of that idea. And perhaps we need to go back and determine whether or not it's a point of sale or, or importing, just the whole idea of importing styrofoam. I do note that there are some businesses now when you do go, I'm going to go pick up my lunch. Uh, the containers are now biodegradable. And so, um, you know, as Senator Tello mentioned, there are companies uh, and restaurants already um, that are beginning to address this issue in terms of their own operations. But in looking at the bill, I did want to inquire on page six with regards to section um, 54C004 cost, cost recovery, um, where it says the Guam Solid Waste Authority shall access expanded a polystyrene surcharge in addition to standard surcharges of no less than 30% of standard charges and all municipal waste derived. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just curious, what, what exactly does this section do with regards to this additional 30% charge and who, who is this to that's not covered by this legislation? Do we know And the sponsor of the bill, is anyone there can elaborate perhaps? So I guess that question could be for um, either legislative secretary Amanda Shelton or uh, Youth Congress uh, Kiana Yabut if you can respond to that question. I don't know if Kiana is still here, but I'll, I'll yield to her if she is. She's having a connection issue, so you can give her a moment. Maybe this will give us an opportune time for a quick recess, so since we have to reset. So maybe a, a quick five, five minute recess uh, at this time. <laughs> 